we were lacking a certain level of fire. What was it like cheating? I mean, like, not... <laughs> tell us the details! Let's go tell a so novella! I took off her clothes, yeah. I believe that cheating goes so much deeper than what we as a society want it to mean. The way that our dynamic is, is not traditional. And it and it's so thriving and so beautiful and so amazing. I trust you, yeah. I trust us, and I trust that we're in a place where we can get playful yeah. at a Layla Martin party. Give yourself the freedom to explore. How can I meet her in a sensual way? And she also had a story made up about something. I don't know how graphic we want to get here. As graphic as you want. So one, one of my favorite things. Uh, can I go there? Is that okay? Sure. I'm Layla Martin. I'm your host of this tantric life. This podcast is for you to learn about and be able to use the incredibly powerful system of Tantra in your life. I have been teaching and studying classical and neo-Tantra for over 20 years. And when you apply that to sex, love, and relationships, as I love to do, you end up having conscious relationships, the deepest, most epic and magical sex, and the kind of intimacy that you get to be grateful for on your deathbed. And I want you to have your own magical journey in your own way that takes you from wherever you are now to the most outrageous and true and beautiful expression of sex, love, and relationships that is available to you. Hi, and welcome to This Tantric Life. I'm your host, Layla Martin. I'm so excited to share with you today a couple that has not only blown me open with their love and their devotion, but in the journey of our deep friendship over six plus years now, I have seen them overcome obstacles that are so challenging and so common in our society, but instead of it breaking them apart, they have transmuted the pain, the challenge, the, the heartbreak that mm. I have seen them in at times into one of the highest devotional loves that I have seen in a couple who has been together for more than 10 years. Something that inspires me deeply is their erotic connection. I see how much they still want to fuck each other mm. each and every day when they have been through so much. So I bring you today, Johan Erb and Rachel Pringle. Johan is the founder of the Pyramid Breath Method. This is an amazing activation of body, heart, and soul through breath work, but he also includes arrows, something that's so important in the full activation of embodied breath work. They work separately and together in their body of work. Rachel has also created the Temple of the Wild, where she initiates women into their sacred wild, their sacred arrows, and the full expression and embodiment of their feminine power. Together, they have created a body of work that helps couples have what they have, be able to include arrows and heart awakening and spiritual practices in their journey of partnership, and to also be able to step into this path of devotion, even when things have been challenging or tough over time. This body of work they call Tantra of Life. I'm so excited to talk to you today specifically about their journey with Johan being in the avoidant patterning of relationship style. And many of us who have ever dated avoidant men know how painful that can be, how challenging that can be. And today I want us to discuss how instead of pushing that man away, how it is possible because I saw Rachel do it, to love him into his magnificent open heart. They've also dealt with cheating and infidelity inside of their relationship. Again, something that in the mainstream we might hear like ditch him, mm. be done, go away, it's over. And I have seen this couple not only resolve it from the depth of integrity and truth and hard conversations, but bounce back even more powerfully in love, even more devoted. And here's the biggest thing, even more in trust of one another even though it was such a challenging journey. So in this conversation today, I'm so excited for us to open the field, open the transmission so that we can understand even more about this path of divine partnership and how you can have it for yourself, whether you're partnered or you're looking to create this kind of magic in your own life. Welcome, Rachel and Johan. Woo! Damn. <laughs> Hot damn. <laughs> yes. <Ooh>. Wow. <laughs> Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for that incredible yeah. intro. I got emotional. Actually, yeah, me too. Just, just thinking about our journey and, and you know, you touched on 
some real powerful points in there and it's it's been a journey my love yeah. congrats on yeah. 10 years we did it yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's our little secret double tap yeah. high five, uh, which is part of the part of the method. You know? <laughs> yeah. So what I'm so excited to really invite all of us into is this deep understanding of how you got here, because I've had the pleasure of knowing you very, very close mm -hmm. um, for years and years and years. So I've not only seen the progression of your relationship, but sometimes when as a couple you get up and you talk publicly, it's like, well, what are they actually doing at home? You yeah. know, what's actually happening? You know, are they just fronting? Yeah. And one of the things that I have really found in true love and in partnership is that it's actually very much like spirituality where everyone can tell you their own version. Yeah. They can tell you what works for them. They can tell you what helps them. They can give you their vantage point in the universe. And at the end of the day, when it comes to love, we actually have to figure it out for ourselves. We have to be like the main <sighs> character energy of our own love story. So we can't look to any couple and be like, wow, that's exactly it. That's what I need to have. That's what I need to create. Because just like spirituality, it's like the universe wants to try us and test us. Yeah. So if someone could give us all the answers, mm -hmm. it wouldn't make us warriors of love, mm -hmm. warriors of true love. Mm -hmm. But what I love about you as a couple and what I want to talk about today is you two are modeling something that we've been told mm -hmm. doesn't exist. Because I have dinners with you. I go to parties with you. And you're literally like, we just fucked. We love each other. And you're like, we can't wait to get home and fuck each other, right? And after going through so much, right? It hasn't been all rainbows, fairy tales, and unicorns. There's been real pain. There's been actual trauma in yeah. your marriage and in your relationship. Mm -hmm. But you got here. Mm -hmm. And what I want to talk about today is how did you get here? Because we not only want to know that it's possible... But we want to know how, mm -hmm. how a couple can do that journey, how you did it in your own way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'd love to start, though, with something that I think so many of us have faced, which is falling in love with an avoidant partner and an avoidant man specifically. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start there and then we'll go through the progression of what has been challenging mm -hmm. and then we'll get to how you have blossomed into this devotion. Because mm -hmm. I've actually seen, and I want to say this as we start, Johanna, I've seen you go from avoidant and shut down to like model devotional husband. Like when you talk about your love for Rachel, having a family together, how much you adore her. I feel you tear up at parties now. Like I experienced that in you. <laughs> I'm tearing up right now. <laughs> what? And we all want this for men, right? This ability to find that heart and that devotion, even when the pain of your childhood made it more unlikely that you would ever make it through that portal into that kind of love. So can you share with us, take us back to what was it like to be an avoidant man, even dating? Mm -hmm. And how did your avoidance show up when you first met Rachel? Yeah. Great question. So first of all, coming from Estonia, Eastern Europe, Soviet Union, you know, where the culture is very much shut down, at least it was at the time. And, you know, being a man is like, you are an avoidant. If you're a man, you're just, you know, you're strong. You don't cry. You don't show feelings. Feelings are stupid. Feelings are weak. And so that was very much my imprinting. And um, I, I also left Estonia to Finland at a young age of 10 and, and had to shut myself down further because I was bullied and I was, felt very alone. And so there's, there's a lot of sort of trauma on top of the already cultural avoidance that was present. And how it really showed up is I... I I was so scared to to um, share any vulnerable part of me because it felt like it would end my life essentially that I yeah. I just built up all these crazy walls to to hide behind and I you know I was, I was pretending to be the the calmest coolest you know <clears throat> most put together person but on the inside it was I was just falling apart and I was yeah. like, having like panic attacks and sweating profusely and sh shaking and like trying to control it and then like putting it onto other people. And so, and I just want to pause really quick there mm. and say, like, in my experience, both professionally mm. and dating, this is actually so common yeah. for so many men yeah. and especially so many men who are actually powerful, mm -hmm. who are actually successful in the world. And yet they are struggling inside. And I just want to note that because in sort of dating teachings and culture and like what I see on Instagram right now, it's like, fuck him if he stonewalls, yeah. fuck him if he's avoided, yeah. fuck him yeah. if he does this. And while there can be this like 
don't stand for poor behavior, yes. which is an important message for women and for all of us to receive. There can also be this incredible judgment towards men's pain. Mm -hmm. And we don't always know, right? Like, sorry, with the Russian invasion, yeah. you don't necessarily survive by feeling, mm -hmm. right? And so many men that I've known who have had this deep avoidance, they also were bullied. They were mm -hmm. immigrants. They were ostracized for one reason or another. We don't, we never know mm -hmm. why anyone is hurting. Mm -hmm. And as a culture, I think sometimes we really don't understand men's pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm grateful for this conversation and grateful to, to know that you can go from that place to, to an opening. And, uh, you know, going back to how it showed up in the beginning was the only place that I would allow myself to feel intimacy uh, was during sex. So during sex was a time when I, I would be fully present, mm -hmm. fully available. And, you know, and it was so confusing for my partners yeah. because in those moments I was right there. I was with you 100 percent, 110 percent. You know, and I was uh, passionate and, you know, that's when I would give all of everything of me. And as soon as the sex was over, it was like a wall went back up. Right. Yeah. It was a wall of thick ice, you know, mm. and it was so jarring to my partners. And I just thought that that's how it is. Like I didn't I hadn't witnessed something else. And, you know, from my sort of male lineages, too, I didn't I hadn't witnessed anything else either. And so that's the code I was carrying. And. And to answer your question, the way that, you know, Rachel really got through to me was if, if people would ask me to describe Rachel in, in, in one word, I'm, I like to use two words is relentless love, relentless love. She just wouldn't take no for an answer, you know, and, and so many other folks in the past got really frustrated. And it was also I was at a point in my life as a younger man when I was really unwilling to open, mm -hmm. you know, and when Rachel and I met, which was I was 36 at the time, I'd seen enough of my own patterning and cycles repeat to go like, wow, I'm creating the same thing over and over again, which is I meet these amazing women. Most of them are wounded because that's I was, you know, trauma bonding. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I could be avoidant and they would be, you know, uh, needy towards it. And they would just, we would be in this, this game and it would just destruct. It was mm -hmm. self-destruct. It would implode or explode. Mm -hmm. And uh, neither of us would get what we really wanted. And with Rachel, she just was willing to um, love me, um, even though I was an avoidant, even though I was shut down, even though um, uh, I wasn't willing to meet her in that way. And her mastery was not engaging me up here yeah. in in my brain and sort of you know as you know it's like with your intelligence or with your um this part of your head you can run circles around people and you can always find how something's off or wrong or not good enough and now's not the time and she completely like bypassed that mm -hmm. not completely but enough where she went like underneath the walls and the moat and just like touched the heart mm -hmm. and in that space you know, it was like all my guns were pointing outwards and, you know, there was dudes, you know, with bows and arrows and <laughs> flamethrowers and they completely just they got Trojan horse to this love experience that she was inside of my castle now in my heart. And then the ice began to melt. And, you know, and then I would have many freak outs and, you know, do the thing. But over time, she just relentlessly accepted, accepted me, loved me, saw my trauma, didn't associate me with the trauma, saw that there was two separate things. And it was able to to love me open and you know it was it continues to be one of the most profound experiences ever i didn't think it was possible yeah and yeah. i think a lot of guys out there don't think it's possible yeah all right i can't wait to hear from you <sighs> about all of this we're going to get so into how you can be that level of devotion <laughs> what that feels like what that takes um you've saved my ass with your teachings <laughs> on this so we're gonna we're gonna dive into that um I would love Johan because so many of us, I know as a woman, right? I have experienced that flip from like so much openness to so much shutdown. Mm -hmm. So my first question mm -hmm. is what does it feel like in your body as a man when you go from like, I'm so open sexually to like push away? Like what's, what, what story are you telling yourself? Mm -hmm. What's actually happening mm -hmm. inside that that's the most natural behavior for you? Mm -hmm. Sadly, I think avoidant men uh, and, and avoidant people um, live up here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right. They haven't traversed down here. And it's, say it's the longest journey, right, from here to here. And so when you're connected, for me, it was like, this was very open. My lower chakras are like really open. This was very activated. I was a very sexual person. Mm -hmm. And this was very activated. But this right here was shut off. Yeah. So the presence, even in the sexual space, was down here. My heart wasn't really engaged. Yeah. And so it's easy when the heart's not engaged to go into story mm. and go like, oh, well, this is just not my person or they can't handle me or they haven't experienced enough trauma or, you know, it's not right for another reason or whatever else. Because you just you, you intellectualize it and you tell yourself a story. Your heart's not involved. So it's very easy when the sex drive turns off or you're complete, be like, oh, uh, yeah, on to the next, you know, because mm -hmm. as soon as if you don't do that the blind spot mirrors begin to happen and you're like, oh, and so you find somewhere else to go. So you don't have to look into those blind spot mirrors because yeah. you're not ready yet or so scary because the, you know, the pile of shit behind you is so large that you feel so overwhelming to, to acknowledge. Yeah. And so you avoid it. Yeah. At, you know, and the part of our identity, and I fully had this story um, that if I open myself to a woman, she's going to manipulate Mm. she's going to take advantage mm -hmm. uh she, you know i will become her little bitch mm -hmm. i will be less masculine i will be less safe uh i won't know my direction which way is up or down like i'll lose myself mm -hmm. i will die a death and i did mm -hmm. die a death and with that dying of a death i got to rebirth myself mm -hmm. you know uh into who i get to become moment to moment now mm -hmm. and without that dying of a death and that's what we're so scared of is that death process because it is a death process for mm. the identity that's holding on gripping so scared you know fighting for its life and you know looking for the success without the fulfillment thinking you're going to get the fulfillment when you have the money when you have the babes when you have the houses when you have the cars whatever it is and it never ever arrives mm. you know we mm. all know a lot of successful people who have the success but don't have the fulfillment yeah and you can't have that without dying that death yeah yeah yes <laughs> something that i know so many of us are longing for yeah. like 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 i wish he would find the courage yeah. to die that death yeah because there's something so beautiful on the other side so we're gonna talk about that too we've got we've got lots of let's <laughs> 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 not forget anything yeah, yeah. that's on the list all right so something that you shared with me that i also think so valuable to experience because like I'm tearing up because as you're sharing that, I both feel for you. Mm. Like I feel for what you've been through. I feel for the pain of all avoidance on the planet, right? Men and women, people yeah. of all genders. Yeah. And I know how much that behavior has, has hurt me, right? Because yeah. to be on the receiving end of it, so painful. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that I think is why there's so much rage on Instagram of like, how dare you ghost me? Like, how dare you like, you know, put up a wall or whatever, because there's this like, oh. mm -hmm. and I think the biggest, the biggest lie that those of us on the receiving end of avoidance tell ourselves is like, there's something wrong with me, Yes, you know? And that's the big busting of that myth, right? Like all you're trying to do is avoid your fucking mountain of pain behind you yeah. and your own damn heart because it's so like yeah. protected yeah. and it leaves a wake of very hurt, mm -hmm. you know, in your case, women mm -hmm. in, in its in its path. And so I just want to balance for all of us listening the deep empathy mm -hmm. for the avoidant mechanisms on both sides, mm -hmm. you know, the recipients of it and the people who, who are in it because there's so much pain yeah. all around. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you shared with me a long time ago is like when you first got together with Rachel, like who you are now like devotionally in love with, you could get so avoidant that you didn't even want to be touched, right? Like she couldn't <laughs> even touch you. So can you share a little bit about that again, just to get this understanding mm -hmm. and, and for those of us who, who love an avoidant to be like, okay, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah, so I would, for example, after having sex with a person, they want to like cuddle and snuggle, and I'd be like, "Yo, <laughs> back the fuck off! What are you doing? Why are you being weird right now?" You know, that was like literally people, and and it it, it was in my case to the point where like, somebody would touch me, and I would have my eyes closed. 
I would see my body from the inside light up with their energy. Mm. And it would, li- it would, I was, I would recoil because mm. it, it was that much. That's how avoidant I was mm. to intimacy, right? Mm. And um, and so Rachel, when we would drive, she would, you know, always put her hand on my leg. And I remember in the beginning, sometimes I would just remove her hand because I would get nauseous. Mm. I'd literally be driving and be like, mm. it was like intense nausea. And then I, but then, you know, I was, okay, I'm going to breathe with this. I'm going to learn because she would put her hand right back. Yeah. Right. And now, you know, cut to 10 years later, uh, you know, if her hand's not on my leg when we're driving. It's weird. I'm like, well, put your hand here. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> Which, you know, it naturally goes there. But it, it, it was so much of my inner work of willing to surrender to this touch and this love, to this presence of another person and trusting that it's okay, that it's safe. Yeah. And, you know, again, there's this whole story and, and I can really tie it back to my childhood, like, you know, self-reliance, right? You can't trust anybody. Yeah. You know, there was like deep betrayal of like best friends who became bullies, right? Mm-hmm. Like I gave this person who's a best friend my heart and I trusted that they would stand for me and then they stand stood against me and like, mm-hmm. I can't trust this person. And then hearing from my lineage, like women can't be trusted, they're emotional, you know, they'll betray you, you know, they, they will manipulate you, you know, they will have your baby and then they'll use that baby against you. Like there was all of this story in that. Mm-hmm. And to then begin to, you know, when you get to a certain age and a certain level of ex- life experience, and now with internet and all, all this amazing information that's available for us to begin to question. Yeah. And I think a lot of us that are avoidant, don't even question the programming mm-hmm. and a lot of whatever programming you're running like you don't you just think like this is what is yeah instead of oh shit i got a fucking program that's faulty yeah. you know and this was one of the biggest things f- for us in our in our beginning process her programming coming from a really beautiful family and what that looks like and then my programming and then those two not matching at all mm-hmm. right and then actually being willing to let both of those programs go and go hey let's come up with a new program mm. Mm. why don't we create a program that actually works for us designed by us mm-hmm. for us mm. and that feels good to the both of us that we can both be a fuck yes to so it's not this box or it's not this box it's not that box rather it's an open os that we choose to create moment to moment yeah. as we learn as we expand as we grow and when we are willing to consider that our nervous system relaxes Mm. because now we're not trying to put ourselves into a box and we're also willing to step out of our box because we maybe have come to the realizations that we're in a box Mm. and then go well what if let's make our own box or a circle or a house or a thing or a tree or whatever (laughs) we want to call it right and we had some real conversations around it because she what felt to me in the beginning was like, I really like this box that I come from. Jump in this box, let's be in this box. It's a really good box. And it's a very good box. Like her parents are epic. It's a great box. And there's still room to grow and expand, right? Yeah. I was like, I don't want to be in a box. Mm. And we... I were, want to be in a tree. I want to be... Yeah, and we talked about foundations and we talked about all these different ways of actually creating something that is very, instead of static, yeah, very fluid. Yeah where we both feel free and there isn't, there's lots of wiggle room. And also as we make these agreements that we can renegotiate yeah. as we grow and as we evolve, as we expand. And in that way, again, my nervous system as an avoidant now is like, oh, so I don't have to commit to this box. I don't have to commit. I can, it, there's a lot of freedom. Mm. And when there's freedom, mm. the avoidant part of me can come forward and step into the freedom and feel more expansive Yeah. and realize, oh, I've been in a box. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah. Mm. All right. So we're going to pause there and then we're going to figure out how you got to this devotion. And for those of you who didn't have amazing loving childhoods, please also know that I apprenticed myself (laughs) with not only Rachel Pringle, but other friends of mine, Jen Partridge being one, who were able to love at this Mm. level. Mm. And so I could find that in myself as Mm. well. Mm. That like it, yes, we're going to learn from Rachel about this devotion and and draw wisdom from her imprint of love. And for those of you who are like, but what if I didn't have a great childhood? You can also get there. Yeah. But first let's get high on plant consciousness. So (laughs) 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> I have our sexy supplement line, mm. Mood, which is plant-activated supplements. And so I'm going to let each of us choose what we would like to experience right now for the rest of this interview. Ooh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ooh. I love it. My challenge for Johan is I'm going to give him sex magic, which technically you take 20 to 30 minutes before sex to feel more pleasure <laughs> and activation in your body. But you can also use it to get high during a podcast. And then we're going to challenge him to see if he can wait until he gets back to Topanga to rip Rachel's clothes off. <laughs> I can't wait to get home. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, Rachie, we have plant activated play, which takes you out of your head, puts you into your body. So you feel like, oh, there's amazing, outrageous feelings inside your body. Sensuality, which is, oh, it like makes you feel all tingly and good inside of your skin. And ecstasy, which is more of like, boom, like champagne bubbles going mm. through your entire body. You can, if you want, combine that with sex magic. I will because I'm a plant activated junkie. Or you can just have one. What would you like? I think I would, I'll do sensuality mixed with sex magic. Why not? We're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, let's go. <laughs> awesome. This is my first time trying this. This is really oh, exciting. It's, good. it's good. It's like minute 47, yeah. threesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, fuck it, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Even the way that Layla drinks is erotic. Yeah. <laughs> Pours that sparkling, yeah. sparkling water <laughs> throughout. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm, let's get sensual. My favorite thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> You can mix sex magic with literally any drink. I'm just gonna flip that over. Yeah, oh, we yeah. can. Wow. Johan, excellent pyramid breath. Yeah. Sex yeah. magic party. party and bartender. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> elixir bartender. <laughs> We should be making this noise the rest of the time. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> it smells really good. Yeah, no, it smells delicious. Oh my gosh, it smells like candy. Yeah, you know, you could do a soda. Mm. Yeah. Your next thing is like oh my a God, soda. It's delicious. Yeah. It's actually already like pre made, you know? Yeah. Like this is great. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yum. Mm -mm. I want to share with you all about play. So these are our sexy supplements from our brand new company, Mood. And these are custom formulations designed to get you results in your nervous system from daily use. So you take play every single day. And what it is designed to do, we worked with a team of all female scientists, is to get you out of your head and into the pleasure of your body. So if you know the feeling of like working all day long, I know this feeling, getting off and being like, Layla, do yoga, Layla make out with your partner. Layla, like do something, go be in nature. And as I'm just like scrolling on Instagram, one of the things that was so helpful that I learned was that it can take up to two hours to shift from sympathetic state, go, 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 go into a deep parasympathetic relaxation where you would actually like want to make out with someone. So this formulation is designed to help you make that switch. It does it by giving your body a natural high and a feeling of deep pleasure. It uses things like cacao flavonoids, sacred lotus, macuna periens, which helps support your dopaminergic system, which increases your desire, your desire to do things, to engage with the world. And it even has this amazing plant called kana, which is a heart opener. So when you feel good in your body, rushes of pleasure, when you feel a heart opening, you want to connect, you want to be more intimate. So as you take this over time, it's going to help you want more sex. It's going to help you be more playful in your life. It's going to help you do more awesome things. I personally love taking this formula before the gym. I love taking it before yoga and I absolutely love taking it before making love. You can combine it with sex magic, our other incredible product. You can find out more over at shopmood.com. We've got a special discount code for you as a listener of this podcast. It is this tantric life 15, this tantric life 15. You pop it in at checkout in the discount code section. It'll give you 15% off your first order. So you can head over to shopmood.com, get yourself some play and it comes in both supplements. So just capsules you can pop every day and this beautiful velvet chocolatey flavor that I like to mix into almond milk and have in the afternoon as a kind of lovely luscious pick me up. All right. So Rachel, mm -hmm. I would love to know what did that avoidance feel like when you first encountered it? And what did you tell yourself? What did you feel so that you could, as Johan said, reach him from the heart mm -hmm. and not get into the 
the trauma loop. Yeah, I mean, it's very much what Johan expressed. I mean, he's one of the most loving humans, even when he, in their beginning stages, when he was full on avoidant. When his love was turned on you, it was incredibly potent. And so when that would show up, it would go from a hundred to zero in the matter of seconds. And it was excruciating. Mm. It was absolutely devastating to the system because we would go from like, you could feel the energy of the room, his love penetrating me, like seeing me, celebrating me. And then energy just sucked out of the room and a complete wall in front of him. And I couldn't reach him. And it was seemingly out of nowhere and with no like reasoning. So it was, it was jarring to the system. And especially, you know, in the beginning stages of our relationship, he would, he was traveling more and I was traveling more and it would specifically happen. Like he would go away or I would go away. Oh my gosh. I, just, I totally forgot about that. Oh, and I, you know, we'd be talking on the phone and like, we were the, the, like we'd always communicated incredibly well, like long conversations. I can't wait to see you. I miss you. And then we'd come home and it would be days of like, if he was like, you're, you're an alien to me. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, it was devastating to my system. I want to just jump in really quickly. Yeah. The moment that was, I think, the most jarring always for, for the both of us was when we were communicating on the phone, you know, mm -hmm. and, and FaceTiming, and like there was so much love. And then I would fly back to mm -hmm. LA and she'd come and pick me up. And I would see her and I feel repulsed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I literally, and she was like, oh my God. And we've just been on the phone, like, I just landed. So excited to see you. Like, I love you. Mm -hmm. Can't wait to hug you. And then we see each other literally at the airport and she's coming towards me from that space of love and i'm like i don't know who you are yeah literally feeling like i don't know this person yeah, yeah. like that's how shut off i was and how jarring that was for the both of us yeah to the point where i didn't want to travel she didn't want me to travel because each time i came back i was like we have to almost like start over yeah, yeah. 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 And I think it's exactly what you express, Layla, is like the first thing that we go to is what's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. What am I doing wrong here? And it was, you know, to, to like zoom out and to see like my own journey and the, and specifically the other person's journey when dealing with an avoidant is, and I'm grateful for it now is because it really taught me how to get out of story. Mm -hmm. And it taught me how to be in my empower for me specifically in my empowered divine feminine expression, mm -hmm. which is to bypass the mind and drop into the heart. Because after a while it was like, this is a pattern and this isn't my pattern. Mm -hmm. This is his pattern. Mm -hmm. And and I, I started to eventually see that like physical energetic recoil, right? And it was, and I could watch him go from being in his body and in his heart into his mind and into storyland. Yeah. And that was what was separating him. And through that journey, I was able to really understand like, this is, this is his, it's not just he's avoiding because of what's wrong with me. It, this is his protective mechanism. This is his defense mechanism because he's absolutely petrified inside. He, he doesn't know what to do with this amount of love. And, and to what you expressed earlier, Layla, like I have beautiful parents, but I've had my trials and tribulations. I am a loving human. That's part of my code here. And why I'm doing what I'm doing is to, to understand the depth and the power of devoted love. And, and I, you know, in Johan's express in, in the beginning of our relationship, it's like I created him for me specifically to have my own up levels around, you know, making everything about me, taking it personally, being in my people pleaser, abandoning myself, rejecting myself, and trying to mold myself into a box that was seemingly appropriate for his, for him to love me. Mm. Because every time I tried to do that, it didn't work, mm. which led me to the realization that this isn't about me, mm. right? And which after having that awareness and feeling that in my body, it actually led me to this surge of power within myself of like, to what you so beautifully expressed, which is I believe we're all here to help each other heal. Mm. I really deeply and profoundly believe that. And we need to do that together. We can't mm. do that separately, especially as men and women, because we've been sort of pinned against each other for a long time. And even with the uprising of the feminine, which obviously I'm a full advocate of, there's been a bit of an imbalance. And I believe the true like rising of the feminine, if we really want to get into the depth of that, it's re realizing that we are the leaders. Mm. Mm. We are the ones that hold the vision. Amen. Yeah, we are the ones that show them what is possible because we have that code inside of us. That's the reason why we're here. It's a reason why we birth children into the world and, you know, 
are, are the originators of holding the energy of the community. And so knowing that I'm grateful for this journey because I got to see him and to what he so beautifully expressed about his childhood. And from my perspective and in my experience, all of that is true. And I also, you know, recognized his relationship with his mother mm -hmm. when he got taken away from his family by his mother, who was 21 at the time mm -hmm. and was only doing everything she possibly could to she protect him. when she had me, but that was... Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. But I mean that young of a, you know, like she was doing what she knew to protect her son, but to him it was, you know, betrayal mm -hmm. and taking me away from the people that I, that I love mm -hmm. and I don't trust the feminine. Mm -hmm. And that's what I saw through this ongoing dynamic was he, it's not that he doesn't trust me. Mm -hmm. He doesn't trust the feminine. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't trust to exactly, as he said, to let his guard down and to be like fully held. He doesn't feel safe. It was life or death. I could feel it in his system. He would go. And again, I think that my awareness, because both of us chose to bypass taking it personally, mm -hmm and after some years and get into the depth of why, why is this happening? What is this here to teach me? Like, what is this showing me about this person? How can I get into the willingness to a growth oriented mindset and go into the depths? And I could see that it was, you know, he, he was petrified to mm -hmm. let me in. Mm -hmm. And so I took that as in a way, like, as like, oh, I'm going to show you what love is mm. and it is going to heal you. Mm. And you get to feel the safety that you so deeply crave and don't think you are allowed to have. Mm. And and it's happened and mm. it's miraculous. And I believe that we all have that capability. It's just, you know, incorporating the right tools and having the ability to see beyond our stories and our wounding, because most of us are, are connecting based off of that. Mm. It's trauma bond or wounding bond, or we're, we're just talking to that part of ourselves. And as you said, like, I saw that as separate. I was like, this isn't the real. And I remember that moment very specifically. And it was when we were going through our deepest moment of our rupture. And like, it would have been the perfect opportunity to, for me to be like, fuck you, I'm out. Mm -hmm. And he went into a flailing moment of, and he like sort of collapsed inwards. And he went into this dialogue of like, this is just who I am. And like, this is who I'm always gonna be. And I don't know of any other way to be. And in that moment, I was like, this is your trauma. Mm -hmm. I was like, this isn't who you are. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is just something that you experience and you don't have to let it define you. Mm -hmm. And you get to be free from this. And I wanna help you do that because I know who you really are in this moment. Mm -hmm. And we, I think as human beings can experience that. We can see when someone is in their head and in their story and in their trauma versus that heart opened experience. And like, can we lean more into that versus just hitting that button over and over again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think this is, this is a question that came to me. I, have a few questions. Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. In that moment, I, I want to come to that moment where you're seeing Johan at the airport, right? And mm -hmm. you are running towards him with love and he's experiencing repulsion. Mm -hmm. His, his trauma body is activated, right? So for us, it's like, okay, I have, I have basically two choices. Mm -hmm. One is I can go into my trauma. Mm -hmm. And our trauma is going to express as, you know, usually one of the fight, flight, or fawn. Mm -hmm. And so I'm either going to get super angry if I'm in my trauma body and be like, fuck you. Like, how, like, you're repulsed by me. Like, how mm -hmm. dare you? Like, I picked you up from the airport, bro. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right. So that's like, we call that an option yeah. um, in, the, in the trauma field. Um, then there's flight, which yeah. is like, all right, I'm just ditching this motherfucker. Like, I'm breaking up with him. Like, tomorrow or in the car, right? And like, I'm out of here in some way, shape or form, or just dissociating, honestly, mm -hmm. and going into like, a, like just not being there, not being present in the relationship. Or what you sort of mentioned, you, when you did hit your trauma body, it sounds like you were going into fawn, mm -hmm. which is more, I will please you. Yeah. Like I, I will become whatever it is that you need, mm -hmm. right? And this is very common. I feel that in response to, I actually get, I actually do all of them. Honestly, yeah. I'm like, fuck you. Yeah. I'm leaving. And how can I please you? Yeah. <laughs> Should my hair be shinier? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like and so that, that, I just want to, 
humanize for yes. for those of you listening that like it's not so easy to just meet that avoidant wall which we all have we all have Absolutely. some version of avoidance in us as well mm-hmm. like we all know it we've all received it that the inclination the conditioning in the vast majority of us is to go into one of those reactions right yeah. and then often we can go into all of them in some sort of spiraling form and there's no judgment on that because we've been just as conditioned, you know, as you were, Johan, to protect ourselves. Yeah. So like this could hurt, right? The man in front of me that I love is feeling repulsed by me. Yeah. Oh God, like how do I defend back? Like how do I protect myself? And yeah. so we go into our own trauma defense mechanisms as a result. And then that's where, as you two have have referenced numerous times, we're just cycling downwards in our wounding, right? Because yeah. then my wounding body will then activate your wounding body even more, will then activate my wounding body, and then we're just, right? And when we say that the fundamental relationship structure is a trauma bond, we mean that actually deep down inside, what we want to do is just hide in that trauma. Yeah. So like- you want to stay in your avoidance, you want to stay in your fawning, and we're just going to keep cycling in that. You're going to keep staying in the avoidance, you're going to keep fawning, you're going to get more and more kind of closed off, you're going to get more and more, dare I say, like desperate, and Mm -hmm. I know that from my own fawning experience Mm -hmm. of like, how can I make this work, right? And so when we say a relationship is, is a trauma bond, we're both actually wanting to stay in our trauma. Yeah. And so the reason that we're constellating is this, often unconscious desire to stay in our trauma. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we'll stay together if what I want is to be in fawning and what you want is to be in avoidant. And we actually don't want to get into our hearts. I actually don't want to do the healing work. So we're staying together so we can stay in that trauma and not touch the depth of vulnerability. Yes. So to be in a non-trauma bond is to choose to be doing the work to step out of trauma to actually be doing the healing, to actually be on an upward spiral of choosing greater and greater love together. But that doesn't mean that you're without trauma. It means that when your trauma gets activated, you're making this choice to get out of the trauma. Yes. So what I would love for you, Rachel, to hear from you is like in that moment when like maybe the desire to be like, okay, he's repulsed by me. Like what should I, I don't know. My case would be like, should I like sit up straight? Like, mm-hmm. like maybe I can drive the car all sexy. Maybe if we like yeah. put the right music, I don't know. Right. I'm no longer my truth. I'm yeah. in my like, yeah. Oh, let me please you. And as you said, that actually just reinforced the trauma. Yeah. So how did you make that switch then in that moment to be like, ah, the answer for me is actually in my heart is actually yeah. in devotion. Like what actually goes on where you can be like, ah, I'm going to be here. Yeah. I think you expressed it so beautifully. And I think that for me, it was that choice. Mm -hmm. I could see that I was in my trauma and I didn't want to be, I, it was, it felt super disempowering and, you know, it goes directly in line with my work. It was like, this is not how I feel empowered and everything I choose is so that I can feel empowered and embodied in my truth. And so I think that and, and this took some years. It's not like it didn't happen right away. And again, to reiterate, I'm so grateful for those years because it really taught me how to be the, my most empowered and embodied, like divine feminine expression. And, and it led me into expression. It led me into calling him out mm-hmm. and being direct. Because I think that oftentimes when we go into, like I, I would shut down and go into fawn. Mm-hmm. I would like turn meek and, or silent. Mm-hmm. And eventually I was like, I'm and not going to get more repulsed. Yeah. And eventually I was like, I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say the thing that we're both not saying. And I, and when I express, I remember specifically this one time um, in Tulum and we were like in a hot tub and I express, I was like, a part of me feels that you like, are like have total disdain towards me. Mm. And he was like, I do. And that was freeing because Mm. then we could actually talk about it. And I Mm. think the thing with those trauma bonds is that you, you, everyone continues to avoid what's really there. Mm. And then therefore it perpetuates over and over again. And that, that, um, opportunity just like thrust us into communicating Mm. and really, me and I'm again so grateful. It it gave me the strength to say what I could probably have never said mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. because I knew 
again, part of me was like, I can see that this is trauma. This is not about me. And I'm going to show you this is not about me. And I can show you that this isn't serving you either. Mm -hmm. And that I actually want to help you out of this because I deeply love you and care about you. Mm -hmm. And there was a part of me that became really um, relentless. Mm -hmm relentless and I and and it was excruciating mm. in complete honesty you know mm. I remember like nights of I'd get all the way to the edge and I'd be like hysterical on the ground and you know he needed to see me in pain and that sounds so sad but like me breaking open in order for him to realize what his patterns and actions were creating and it wasn't like let's go away from it, it wasn't abusive it was me and my journey of getting into my heart and being cracked open and vulnerable and showing him physically what his patterns were creating. Mm. And as soon as he saw that, a light switch would go off mm. because he didn't want to cause me pain. And I believe people don't want to cause each other pain, mm. but they're so in their protective mechanism that they're, and they're just trying to protect themselves from their own pain. But when you see someone else, and it, this is like going into the, you know, the deeper lever, levels of Tantra of like being able to, what I like to call fully reveal ourselves. Mm. And instead of doing the, you know, dance around and continuing to avoid or continue to be anxious and continue to try to make it better versus just being in the most exposed, most revealing, most honest expression, which is out of the head and into the body, which is yeah. I'm going to show you what this is doing by expressing my deepest heart, which is usually tears and cracking open. And it's not from victim and it's not from come save me. It's from let me show you what you are doing. And when a man, I believe, or any being sees that, something cracks in them mm -hmm. that is, that is, um, makes me emotional, like allows them to be revealed to what they're holding inside of them mm. that they're trying to avoid. Mm. I would like to add to that, that uh, in those moments, I never, I, I encouraged her. She was like, what can I do right now? Yeah. I'm like, don't shrink. Yeah. Mm. So even though that was where she was going, right? She was shrinking. She yes. was uh, trying to appease. I was like, that's the last thing I want you to do. Mm. Even though that's, you know, I could see her like, withdrawing and going to that space. So I was like, I want you to meet me in my fire. I want you to meet me in my disdain. I want you to meet me in this place. And so for her, that was a big growth edge as well. Mm. And that, you know, what she was just describing from my perspective is that growth of, of daring to meet me mm -hmm. instead of shrinking, like puffing, if you will, almost to meet me in that space. But not with like, I'm going to destroy you and fuck yeah. you up and, you know, demean you. But rather, I'm going to show up in my fullness and my full pain mm. and not like just put it on myself and yeah. hide it, but rather reveal all of myself to you. And when I would feel that, my heart would crack. Yeah. Mm. I would open. Mm. Right. Mm. And that was, we were like, and for a long time, still sometimes I'd say when we get into it, it takes for me yes. in order to, when I go into my avoidant, still happens we just did this the other night yeah um you know for 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 rachel to meet me with her fiery passionate painful expression mm. that's when i can understand it yeah and that's when my heart opens mm. and i soften mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but otherwise i'm just like watching it happen and my again in my heart i'm not feeling any feelings. anything i'm just observing i'm like okay she's having a moment and I can't feel. And I can now I can see when that happens, right? You and I, I I think invite everyone like be the scientist of your own experience. Mm. Watch patterns. I believe that's what Tantra really is, is to to use everything that arises to you know, transform ourselves, right? Mm. We're watching and witnessing. And I've always been so deeply fascinated by what certain choices create and mm. starting to see these patterns and I recognize and I can see it now. And he, you know, we do still go cause we're human beings and it's part of our evolution and our growth. It's not a bad thing. And I think that's where a lot of us sort of get, um, dissuaded or we can feel disenchanted because we're under this impression that we're supposed to be living this version of perfect relationship versus actually 
using what arises to continue growing and expanding. And when you choose to do that, it is endlessly interesting and delicious. And when he goes into that now, which is very rare, but it happens and it just happened the other night. It's like, I know I'm like, okay, he's doing that thing where, and he's protecting himself because he doesn't want to admit that he might be wrong. Mm. Right. And, and I do that as well. We don't want to admit. I'm, and I'm never wrong. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I want to add in a, a really valuable tool for our audience. Yeah. And this is something that we, we use all of the time when we're in the space is we infuse in awareness and gratitude yes mm. you know, breath awareness and gratitude into mm. the moment mm. for us you know we're teachers however even if you're not a teacher you're still an embodiment to all of your family your friends your kids your cousins you know the world and so when you're in a contraction if you infuse in the awareness of gratitude of mm. this is happening for us mm. right yeah. now mm. we can we will teach about this yeah. right we will once we like do the Rubik's cube and figure out what this thing is, we'll unlock a new code. Mm. So even in the midst of like, fuck you, I hate you. It's like, pause, gratitude. Wow. When which, mi- which reminds you never, ever happens. That's the other thing is like, I think the most important aspect of these type of conversations, because they are so heated and they are triggering us is like one of the things that we excel at is we don't call each other names. We never have yeah. never called each other names. Johan has never yelled at me in 10 years. Mm. I've yelled at him a handful of times, mm. all times when it was needed. Mm. And we are very, like, that is something we are so attuned to because mm. words are, our energy and they hit us and they mm. activate us, especially when we come from these like really, you know, deeply richly activating childhood where a word can send us into a trauma mm. response immediately. And I, I, I see that often with couples is like, you know, like let's stop that in general altogether completely. Yeah. No one ever likes to hear that. Yeah. You know? Even if you're feeling it, yeah. right. Which are, you can feel hate and anger and frustration and you inside of you, you want to express in that way. Don't. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I think that is incredible ground zero to really realize in relationship is we're talking about relationships being hard. We're talking about arguments. We're talking about painful things happening. We're talking about trauma. And yet, and I can say this from personal experience, the difference between a relationship that can thrive through all of that and a relationship that is genuinely struggling is that deep commitment to we don't get super toxic. We don't call each other names. We don't like go for the jugular is the word that I want to use. Even if we're feeling super triggered, like that's when you take space and to really start to have that awareness of, I can't unsay these things. Yes. So let me always hold this most sacred thing in my life, right? Yeah. Sacred union. This is the most sacred thing in my life with the reverence it deserves. And you know you could, because honestly, if you had a gun to your head, Mm -hmm. you could always not call your partner a name. Mm -hmm. So we know we have it in us. That's so, so, so important in this. The other thing I just want to investigate a little bit from what you've been talking about, Rachel, is you know I can imagine so many of us asking ourselves this question. I have asked myself this question, which is like, look, if I'm dating an avoidant man, how do I know? How do I know whether I'm just in a trauma bond Mm -hmm. and how do I know whether this is me, you know, giving again my precious time, space, energy and body to a man who's going to like push me away after sex and then leave eventually. Like, like how, how do you know whether you're on a path of devotion or on like a carpet path? Mm. And some of the things that I've really explored around this is, is number one, it takes a certain level of relationship to one's trauma yeah to make it empowering mm-hmm. because you could have the story of like dating an avoidant man is always disempowering and mm-hmm. you, you're never going to get what you want and it's always going to be challenging that is true if you are going to default to your fawning yes that is true if you're going to default to your freezing yeah. and your fighting right mm-hmm. if you are going to stay in your own trauma pattern yeah. in that relationship yeah then that is not a healthy or good relationship for you yes and we're not going to get anywhere yeah in that case, like I would say, okay, do more coaching, do more therapy, do mm-hmm. more relational work, um, find a secure human. Yeah. Maybe that is the answer. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if truly you can be honest with yourself and say, yo, in that moment at the airport, ain't no way I'm yeah. like getting into my heart. Right. Yeah. Okay. So then maybe this is not the dynamic for you. Right. Yeah. Having that level of honesty, because I can feel some of that like rage in so yeah. many of us around yeah. avoidant men comes from actually 
I let myself stay yes. in my trauma, yeah. right? And so in that, I either chose to be in a relationship where I was just getting in my trauma patterns all the time, or I never got to the empowered choice of saying, I'm going to get into my heart. I'm going to practice devotion, yeah. right? And so being really honest with yourself, because if you can get to the place of, I'm going to use this yeah. information, I'm going to use my partner's truth as a way to get into my own heart, mm -hmm. as a way to get into deeper devotion, well, then, then staying in that relationship is actually an empowering choice. Yeah. Then it is a Jedi school for heart priestesses, right? Or heart priests. <laughs> and so Amen. like in that way, it's not about him or them. It's really about what would be my journey in this relating and do I wholeheartedly choose it? Yeah. Because I also can't guarantee an outcome. Yeah. I can't guarantee that he's yeah. going to stay. Yeah. I'm sure what was hardest for you about that, especially in those early years, was not knowing yeah. that it was all going to work out, not knowing that you would blossom into this devotional amazingness that you have, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, I am choosing to be in my heart. I'm choosing the path of devotion because that is what is true for me. Yeah. And because I would rather have the opportunity of choosing my heart and choosing my devotion than anything else. Yeah. I also think some good indicators, and I'm just studying this. I haven't really seen this articulated anywhere of like, do I stay or do I go yeah. with this person who's evidencing avoidance? I do think them not calling you names yes. and them not fully attacking you 100%. is very important, right? Yeah. So in the avoidant man that I've been with, that has been the saving grace, mm -hmm. right? It's not like you are disgusting and you are repulsive, right? It's like, I'm feeling repulsed right now. Like mm -hmm. I'm feeling shut down right now. I am struggling with my thought patterns that really want to push you away, right? There is a level of self-responsibility around it. Yeah. And even if it overcomes him at times, so he does believe it, he's still not toxically like putting it on me. Yes. That makes all the difference, Massive. right? Makes all the difference because it allows for transformation and love without like drowning in the toxicity of that pain becoming projected, yeah. right? So there's some people who are like, I feel repulsed right now. You're repulsive. There's something wrong with you. It's very different than I can feel I'm in my avoidance right now. Yeah. I can feel repulsed right now and I'm going to own this. Yeah. Not 100% of the time. No one does it 100% of the time, but enough yeah. that I'm not tearing you down in this experience. That really opens the field. I also think testing, right, your partnership, when I do get into my heart, mm -hmm. when I do express my pain, is he able to open? Mm -hmm. If no... Time and time again, sometimes it's going to be no, right? But like if it's always no, then he's probably not interested yeah. in coming into his heart. He's probably yeah. not interested in this path of growth and being real about that. So I think there are ways to kind of look at, it's not just is he avoidant, but is he avoidant? Is this the path that I'm a fuck yes to yeah. for myself? Not because I'm going to change him, not because I'm going to get what I want, but who I get to be in this interaction. Is that what I want? Is that me calling myself forward in a way yeah. that feels good to me? And then is he able to do this process in a way that's not super toxic, that's not going to leave me? If he's projecting, attacking, and tearing down, I'm probably going to get destroyed in that process. That's not yeah. being self-honoring. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's we don't want that. Right. And that's, that's borderline, I would say abusive. Like yeah. that's, I don't, I don't think that that's okay in any circumstance. Right. That's not, that's not setting a grounds for love. And the thing with, with us was there was a willingness. There's always been a willingness. And I think that's the most important thing is like, he wasn't outwardly ever putting it on me. At times it would seem like if we were in a discussion, he would try to make it about me. Oh, well, I'm not feeling this or that. And again, eventually it it was like, I this isn't about me. Yeah. I know this isn't about me. And the the willingness to meet in the heart is like, I could tell that he wanted it. He was just in his drama. And I believe yeah. that we have the ability to feel that because even in the midst of this, we were committed. You know, we were we were together almost right away. Mm -hmm. We said we loved each other. You know, I was like three months in, we moved in together almost immediately. Like there was clear choices that we wanted to make this happen. Mm -hmm. Right. You're thinking about that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there was, <laughs> there was like, the first we, I love you. Yeah. Was, was, uh, <laughs> it was sooner than that, baby. But it, oh, it, yeah, it, yeah. it was so funny. Cause like, you know, Rachel's one of the most loving people on the planet. Earth. <laughs> 
And uh, it, just, it just cracked me up because we hadn't said I love you even though we were feeling the feelings. And then I'm like sitting at my desk and Rachel is like leaving to go. Uh, and she like, as she's walking out the door, she's already out the door in the yard. She's like, love you. And I was like, come back here right now. <laughs> she like comes back in. She's like, what? what? She's, I'm like, don't you do that. Yeah. Mm. Do not do that. Mm. Like that, no. In, and I was like, if you mean that, you're going to say it. You're not walking out the door, not love you like every other thing, you know. So it just it brought me back. That, and that's, a, that's an indication, right? Like even that's such a perfect point to bring up because even from the beginning, I could tell that he wanted intimacy. He wanted connection. He just didn't know how mm -hmm. because of his own wounding and trauma. And I remember, again, I think this is like seven months in, you know, I was aware that he was testing me. Mm. He was, te can I trust this testing person? For years. Yeah, for years. Can I trust this person? Can I let down my guard? And it was really like, okay, I'm going to let down the first guard, and then the second, and the third, and fourth, fifteenth. You like, know, there's another shoe. It's going to drop. It's gonna yeah, drop. I kept... know there's another shoe. It's really high up in the air. And <laughs> it's a big high shoe. And it's a bit, yeah. Like someone really like flipped it up there. She's really masterful. Like, yeah. It's going to drop, and it literally took me years. Years, and it was, and to you know, to to say. Like it was, I agree with you so much. Lee. Like it was, and it still is Jedi love training. Mm -hmm. And I am that human in this mm -hmm. lifetime. And I love that type of challenge because it wasn't challenging in a way that I was broken down. We had and have had through our entire relationship, the most incredible amount of fun. Even mm -hmm. when we were doing this work, it was a desire for us to both do it. And mm -hmm. I think that's the indication going back to your question is that if if one person doesn't want to do it, you can't do the work for them. Yeah. That and that's the thing that drives us crazy is like it's just not possible to to make them open. Now, to another sort of tool is like if I ever had an sort of like intuitive like okay, I want him to open. Mm -hmm. It was my number one indication that I need to open because mm -hmm. I, again, to what I previously said, I believe that we, as this energetic, as the feminine, are the leaders. Yeah. And we set the energetic blueprint of the field. And mm -hmm. if I choose to open, I am leading him into opening. Mm -hmm. If I'm closing, wanting him to open, mm -hmm. it's like, it's not going to work, mm. right? At, the, at least that's my experience and what I've found mm. from years and years of not us not only being together, but the countless couples and, and people that we've worked with, that is the resounding thing. And I think that that's the thing that we get into is that women, and I've seen this so, so much recently and I have so much compassion. It's like, we're like, I don't want to do it. Mm. You know, like they, as a patriarchy have like fucked us, like, can't they do it? And I'm like, no. Mm. <laughs> you know they kind of they literally yeah. can't they can't they you know and it's like we can. it's literally like the hardest pill to swallow as a yeah woman. i had a yeah. moment where i was like wait a minute yeah I was like, wait a minute you took like all the resources and all the social political power and like built the world for yourselves and then i have to make yeah. my way through like all of the rape culture yeah. and perfectionism yeah. yes. and misogyny and like all the stuff about being a woman and then I have to open my heart and love your ass before mm -hmm. you do it for, oh my God. Yeah. Like, it's kind of exhausting when you really get it. Infuriating oh. in a way. And that doesn't mean they don't have to do their work. It does yes. mean though that like oftentimes like the feminine is the leader yeah. Yeah. in relational dynamics. And yeah. so it's like, wow, you want me to go through all that and open my heart. And on some level, universe must know yes. that we're made for it because yes. that's why we got born in these female bodies. You Absolutely. know, like we are up to the challenge. Yeah. Team, this is a legit moment because I'm super tired. I've been working all day long. This is the last ad of the day. I got to tell you about sensuality. And this is exactly what we made Mood for. <laughs> this is why we made this supplement company. Because I'm tired and I want something to support me. So because I'm overwhelmed, because I've worked all day long, there's a part of me that like doesn't want to see my partner right now. Like I don't even want to be touched. I want everyone to leave me alone. I want to get lost in some Instagram rabbit hole, looking at people that make me feel bad about myself and not come back until tomorrow. But what I really, really want actually is like a super sexy makeout, a luscious bubble bath, some sort of self care. I want to do yoga. I want to have an amazing yummy dinner. I want to feel connected to my body. I want to get a massage from him. That's what sensuality is for. It is for the person and woman 
who gives and gives and gives all day long and you've just got nothing left to give in the evenings when you want to have time for yourself, when you want to connect, when you want to be intimate, when you want to do self-care. So sensuality is just packed with ingredients that both calm your system but keep you delightfully, erotically, and sensually activated. So it's not going to put you to sleep, but with things like L-theanine and lemon balm and magnesium, it helps calm you. And then it has these amazing ingredients like damiana, ashwagandha, katuaba, passion flower that actually give you that lift into a kind of dreamy, seductive, shimmery state. So I love taking sensuality before bubble baths. I love taking sensuality before getting a massage from my partner or a professional. I love taking sensuality when I want to relax into the evening, but I want to do something magical like a ritual by candlelight. I'm not ready to go to sleep. This is an amazing product and we are giving you a discount for following along with this tantric life. So you can use the discount code this tantric life 50. It'll give you 15% off your first purchase over at shopmood.com. So if you want to check out these products, get yourself some sensual activation, head on over to shopmood.com. And my favorite way to do ecstatic dance and yoga is actually to combine sensuality and sex magic, our other incredible product over at Mood together. And it gives you this very like floaty, dreamy, transcendental state. So I'd love to talk now because you are a couple who have been very open Mm -hmm. about infidelity that happened, right? Mm -hmm. And this is both, I think, an expression of avoidance that can absolutely happen Mm -hmm. and something that will break most couples but doesn't have to. Mm -hmm. So Johan, I would love if you would share with us, what was it like cheating? I mean, like not... <laughs> tell us the details. Let's go tell a so novella. I took off her clothes. Now. Let's, let's see if we can all get triggered. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that we can. No, what I would love to know is how was that an expression of your avoidance and of your fear? What was actually going on for you mm-hmm. that that could happen mm-hmm. with with your future wife because mm-hmm. you were engaged at the time? Yeah. Actually, the first one was before we got engaged. Yeah, um, let's be clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah which yeah. which I didn't. Do you want me know. to talk about the things that she knows about? Or yeah, yeah, know? yeah. Um, just kidding. I found out about it all at the same time, but yeah. it was like two years yeah. in that the yeah. first time happened. Yeah, which was a horrible experience of keeping. I'm I'm not a good at keeping secrets. I literally had a, a hole in my stomach by the time that uh, uh, I expressed it. However, the thing for me that that sort of drove me to it was I felt. Um, in my experience and, and, you know, in retrospect, seeing, you know, the ways that I wasn't showing up. But at the time, what it felt like we were lacking a certain level of uh, fire between mm-hmm. us, right? Mm-hmm. Like Rachel was still hadn't fully like stepped into the full powerful being that she is now. She was still in the meek sort of pleasing phase of yeah. trying to make the relationship work and that I was repulsed by. And so I was more attracted to these like, you know, fiery, fucked up uh, people, you know, have some trauma or not, whatever, but like aliveness essentially, because mm, yeah. I was blocking aliveness. And in a way that she was not meeting me in, in, with her aliveness yet, because she didn't trust that I wouldn't just run away, mm, yeah. you know? Um, am I right so far? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, so that experience, that the first experience that I had was a couple of years into our relationship. And we were, you know, we were talking about, I was always pushing the envelope, like, let's have sex with other people and let's open ourselves up. And you know, I was looking, again, I was looking for that aliveness outside of our relationship mm. before figuring out our relationship, which yeah. I think is a disaster yes. Yes. waiting to happen, you know? Whew. And when you figure out your stuff, you explore all the aliveness you want. It's just yeah. going to build your relationship. But yeah. when it, that's not there... And then the second time, which was the real juicy, profound one, hard one, was I was working in a film and I was away and um, I fell in love with my, my co-star. And, um, you know, and she had all the, the things like she experienced a lot of trauma. You know, I could relate to her again. The story I had made up at the time was that Rachel hadn't experienced trauma or wasn't expressed in that way. Mm. So she couldn't relate to me. I couldn't trust her to hold me yeah. in my trauma. Yeah. Right. I didn't just think that she could. She did masterfully when the time came. Mm. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm feeling the medicine totally high right now. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, no, it's, 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 it's very subtle and, and beautiful and amazing, but I definitely feel happy. Um, and so what happened was I fell in love with this other woman 
and you know built her up you know she had some of the qualities that weren't activated yet for us in our relationship and as we know from experience you know when you first meet someone you just you go oh they, they're my person you know because mm. you're you're i was totally forgetting about that that 95 percent that was amazing because mm -hmm. you just take it for granted i was fully taking it for granted mm -hmm. And uh, I, was, I got very confused mm -hmm. about who I want to be with. Mm -hmm. I thought this is my person, you know, and I asked Rachel if I could sleep with this person. She said, no, I did it anyway. And then, you know, there was some lies tied in there as well. She's like, did you do it again? I was like, no, I did it anyway, you know, and I was completely like in this, uh, uh, you know, in love, uh, in lust, like obsessed with this person. Uh, phase and then Rachel still graciously showed up for all of this um, and when you know there was even a, a conversation like can I be with both of these people like and she was like I'm open to the idea like she was really able to flow with me through my flailing and not knowing and still be present not shut me down not run away not you know shame or blame or guilt she and was, girl what gave you the strength to do that well, that's the, that's the beautiful thing is like, I think a lot of the time when this happens, the woman is not having her own experience. And mm. then when it originally, the first moment that it happened, I went off on a trip and had my first experience outside of our relationship. And so that was, you know, we've spoken about this like in depth of, you know, for, for those watching, I was, I was praying that he would have great chemistry with this person because I wanted the movie to be great. Mm. And so I was like going to sleep at night praying, oh, let's like really they have the most amazing chemistry. And it was almost like me as the master because of you this happened. <laughs> yeah. I like, mean holy <laughs> shit, I'm a fucking witch. <laughs> but but yeah, like yeah. for me as the master creator because it's so it's so deep. I believe that cheating goes so much deeper than what we as a society want it to mean. Oh, they don't love me so they cheat. It's not it's so much more intricate in that and that's actually what's interesting to me, why, what are you seeking? What are you not feeling met? Where are you lacking like transparency and honesty and all of those things? And for me, it was like, I created this so could, I could have my experience because we were not meeting our, each other sexually at that time. Mm -hmm. We weren't, we didn't know our, our erotic blueprints and our core erotic themes or our, our wounds or our values. We were just sort of, it's, and we always had good sex, but it was, we were missing each other. Mm -hmm. And then in this experience with this other man and this other woman, I got to meet myself mm -hmm. and holy shit. It was like a spark turned on in me. It was like a, my first real Kundalini activation. Mm -hmm. And so even though he had done this terrible thing, I was so ignited that I was like, great, well, let's explore this because I'm turned on. And I actually, to what Johan said, I got to take myself out of the box. Mm. That was the moment that I took myself out of the box of this is how our relationship is going. We've just gotten engaged. We're going to marriage and this is the kind of trajectory that we go on. Mm. And I felt this sense of freedom of like, actually, no, I get to do whatever I want now. Mm. I'm. It's not just him, it's me too. And I believe for me specifically, if Johan hadn't gone that far, I wouldn't have given myself permission because I had that depth of people pleasing and fawning. And that was such a part of me of like, I know how to please myself. So I'm going to make sh my job to please everyone else. Mm. Right. So that moment broke me open. Yeah. And I think what's so important here to note for, for all of us is like, this is tricky territory. Right? Yes. Like, how do you know? Ooh. Right. And you're listening right now. You're like, okay, like my man be cheating. So the answer is for me to go get some yeah. strange, you yeah. know, like you, and I think, I think the main takeaway and what's so important is like you have to be the main character of your own yes, story. Yes. And you actually don't know the answer, right? Like Rachel's answer, Johan's answer, Layla's answer, like not your answer. Absolutely. And that's what's so tricky, mm -hmm. right? Because it could have been that your truth was for Johan to have like two wives. Like we don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. Could have been your truth was that other man that you fell in love with. Like yeah. he was your person. Yeah. Could have been your truth for both of you to explore, heal and integrate in deeper ways, and come back together mm -hmm. and get married, which is what happened, mm -hmm. you know? So like we actually, like there's no prescription. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that's been hardest for me mm -hmm. as I navigate my own love stories is being like, I can, I can give myself more permission Yes, because of you two. Mm -hmm. I can listen to your story and say, 
well, damn. Mm. Like how many women have had their man cheat on them and just like gone into a ball of flames, right? And who who can blame them, yeah. right? Into self-hatred, self-pity. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the only story that yeah. they choose, right? Yeah. How many possibly could have gone into like an empowering narrative of like, well, all right, let's see what happens when I give myself the freedom he's giving himself and let's see what, you know, or what am I lacking or how do I fix it? Like whatever the truth is. And so as we tell this story, I just invite everyone listening not to be like, oh, is that the answer? No, But instead to hear when you live in radical truth and you give yourself permission to own your truth. What becomes possible? This I know. When you own radical truth, it can often be so far outside of the bounds of what society would tell you, mm-hmm. what any book would tell you, what mm-hmm. like Instagram posts would tell you. Yeah. And that radical truth can crack the universe open. Yes. Like that's how you can get quantum shifts in reality. It's mm-hmm. by listening to yourself. So I just want to say like you weren't following a playbook no. of like, oh, well, now it's time to go do this. Like it wasn't like a tit for tat thing. Yeah. You were following your own radical truth. Yes. And that's what broke you open outside of what sounds like was a, like some form of trauma bonding of like, yeah. I'll be in my avoidance. I'll be in my fawning. Let's like, yeah. and and we're going to cycle in this a bit. And yeah. what's it going to take to crack us out of that? Yeah. And, uh, and mm-hmm. to just to say that, because in that moment, you know, and I went on this trip and I was in the desert and it was the first moment I would say in my life where the real me emerged Mm. and it was so liberating. And so, and I was in the full spectrum of my emotions. I was in my full sensuality and sexuality and eroticism. I was in my full heartbreak and devastation. And I just allowed myself to be all of it and to let go of this identity of who Rachel was, which always had it together and was taking care of everyone. I switched to, I'm, oh, I'm here to take care of me. Yeah. And that moment alone completely changed the trajectory of our lives and also led us into the awareness of like, I think that Johan's expression and story was like, I'm not being satisfied sexually. And I got to, from that moment, come back and say, I'm not being satisfied sexually. Mm. And that's the thing that we miss often, right? Mm. Is that we t- one person is right mm. and then the un- other person is wrong. Mm. And in, in relationship, that is never a formula that works, mm. right? Like we're continuously get to check in. And that is what led us into radical truth. And it totally changed our lives. And it took me into the empowered state that he really was yearning for Mm. to be like, okay, yes, I absolutely take full responsibility that I haven't been in that space. And also these are the areas that you get to look at and that I want you to rise into. Mm. And that was jarring for him. And also I believe what he wanted. And I, and I actually believe that men, deeply conscious men who are in this work and who want to be in this work, want to be challenged. Yeah. They want to be met with love. They don't want to be blamed or shamed like any of us. I don't want to be blamed or shamed either. We want to be in radical truth with love and kindness. That to me is freedom. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And thank you so much for sharing so publicly yeah. about the infidelity because it is still such a cultural narrative, right? Yeah. It's so shameful. Yeah. Should never have happened. I feel so bad about this. And you can be a model of like how many of all of us, regardless of gender, I will speak for women. It's like, if you get cheated on, it's because there's something wrong with you. Yeah. You're deficient, right? And I think we can all look at you and say like, you were being such a mind-blowingly amazing partner. Like, sure, you were fawning a little bit. Sure, you yeah. weren't in your full power, but you were showing up with strong devotional love for this man. Yeah. You were showing up so beautifully and like it's actually had nothing to do with you, Mm -hmm. right? And you could use it as a portal to grow Mm -hmm. as we can use any moment of life. But like how beautiful to just keep busting that cultural narrative that like a man will only cheat if like it's deficient in some way, shape or form. Yeah. I would also like to say that, you know, I was, uh, when Rachel told me about, I was like, yeah, go for it. Like, that sounds great, right? And I thought I was so cool with it and so fine with it. I was like, this is awesome. Like, I, I get to have my cake. You get to have your cake. Like, this is great. <laughs> it's gorgeous on cake. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, and again, at the time we weren't, both of us, neither of us was fully in, in 100% transparency. And so some of the details that I found out about later that were communicated in a way that wasn't accurate to my mind um <laughs> when i found out was how deep they had gone or what had occurred i was livid i was mm-hmm. pissed 
And I was very like, I, I, you know, part of me was like ready to murder people. And, and it was a really powerful yeah. learning experience for me. Because again, when we live from the head, right, and we're disconnected from the heart and from our feelings, we assume that we're just cool with things like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, like this is how it looks and this is how it's going to be like when that thing happens, right? Instead of being in discovery, how it's going to be, you already know how it's going to be. And when the fucking shit hits the fan, yeah, it might be the exact opposite of mm -hmm. what you think it was going to be. And that was certainly the case with me. And so it was such a profound learning experience and humbling experience. Oh, fuck. I actually really care about this woman. I don't want her like fucking random dudes or whatever else. Like mm -hmm. I, you know, and we, I was the one after this experience because she wanted to continue to explore. That was like, <laughs> I don't feel safe enough. Can we please close the, the container? The tables have turned. You know? oh. And, and Look she who wants monogamy now. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, so I didn't feel safe because then, you know, the moment that we didn't, we, we touched on lightly, but there was a moment where it was the revelation where like, we were sitting, and one of the things I want to touch on before we do this is we've always shared a spiritual practice together from mm -hmm. day one, and mm -hmm. we still do every day, right? Mm -hmm. And now it's the pyramid breath method where we scream and cry and yell and laugh, and you know, it used to be much more still. However, we it's been such a profound connector when we felt very disconnected. Yeah. And I highly recommend for couples to get into a practice of breath together, just yeah. embodied practices, whatever that looks like, dance and so many other ways. But we were sitting across from each other and it was a moment of like, do we let it all go? Yeah. Or is this over? You mm -hmm. know? And there was a moment when I decided to share everything mm -hmm. that, that I cheated a couple of years ago, how I really felt like all the things that I thought weren't working, the things that I thought I could never say because it would cause so much pain. You know, I think a lot of us feel that, right? Yeah. There's like, I, oh, there's this thing back there, but I can never say that thing. And yeah. that's the thing you most need to say. Yeah. You to free yourself and the other person, because they know you're feeling it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They know it's there. And you're mm -hmm. like, no, what thing? I don't think, mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> anyway, so when I expressed it all and she held me so divinely and beautifully in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I was literally like a fish flopping on, uh, I didn't know which way it was up or down, and I died a death. Mm -hmm. And, and then after that, she didn't know if she wanted to be with me or not, knowing all these things that I'd held back and I hadn't expressed. She didn't know if she could trust me. It was very confused still with, you know, the other persons that she was playing with as well and that aliveness. And so then I knew that I wanted her and it, would, it would, took probably over a year mm -hmm. of me being like, I love you. If, if you want to go and be with another person, I love you. I choose you, mm. you know, I'm, I'm safe now. You mm. can trust me. Mm. And it took her some time, some real time to be like, okay, actually happened on an airplane on the way to such a funny story. Mm. We're flying back from Miami. We're like, this is probably the last time we're going to be with your parents in Miami together. This is probably the end of our relationship. We're on an airplane. We're watching a movie together called Passengers mm -hmm. with uh, Chris, Jennifer Lawrence. And yeah, Chris Pratt, I think. Chris Pratt. And in this movie, there, you know, anyway, watch the movie. It's very touching. <laughs> and it was something lit up in Rachel where she was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to give this a go. Yeah. yeah. You know, but I, for a year, I didn't know. Yeah. And, and I was the price I was willing to pay because that's where I kept her for years before then, mm. you know? And, and so we both <sighs> got to really hold each other and through these experiences we've learned to trust each other deeply mm. and choose each other you know divinely and profoundly and, and again we know that this has all happened for us and we're so grateful for each and every person that we cast in our movie like you said yes you know and to play those roles and the stakes were so fucking high and it hurt so fucking bad and if it didn't hurt so bad and if it didn't the stakes weren't as high we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. yeah nothing would have yeah. changed yeah, yeah. we would have just perpetuated the same fucking thing over and over and over again yeah they it needed to be that painful that jarring for us for the death for her to die a death for me to die a death and we birth each other into who we are now yeah, yeah. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. aliveness so yeah i i would say that the what i witnessed in you two that brought you through that portal was radical honesty 
Yeah. You got radically, truly, deeply 100%. honest with each other in a safe space. Yeah. You held safe emotional space to be so radically honest. Yeah. And I would say radically honest with core devotional communication, not radical honesty, like calling each other names and tearing each other yeah. down, yeah. but really conscious communication, yes. core devotional communication. Yes, absolutely. And you were willing to risk the partnership. Yes. Both of you at one point or another. And I think, you know, I also sometimes in my kind of journey, it's like, you know, there are people who are like, I never had any doubts. And yeah, I'm yeah. like, ah! you know, like, <laughs> Yeah, not true. You know, yeah, and and you stayed for a year in doubt. You mm-hmm. know, you stayed for years in some form of yeah. pushing away yeah. all your own doubt. And and what I saw you both do, which I think is required when you get to those moments, um, is to face what we all call a death portal. Yes, right. Which is like I go to the edge, and I go all the way through it. And in this truth, right, I'm gonna actually stop fawning and trying to people please and like stand in my truth and I might lose Johan yeah. I might lose the relationship but that is the price I'm willing to pay yeah. I'm going to share with Rachel my deepest radical truth right about everything that I'm worried about everything I'm not getting what mm-hmm. I'm not satisfied about and that's a death portal because I'm I'm willing to lose her I'm willing to lose this relationship in service mm-hmm. of truth yeah right and so that death portal, I think so many couples are afraid of. Yes. And we don't realize that in the long-term devotional partnership, yes. what actually we are called towards because it's like, this is the big switch, I think, with relationships. The universe doesn't just want you to be in a happy, loving relationship. Otherwise, we'd all be in happy, living relationships. <laughs> yeah. And we would have biologically evolved yeah. to just like pump that oxytocin and pair bond, like those prairie bowls or whatever yeah. for life. You <laughs> yeah. Know? yeah. No, it's like we got the honeymoon period. Mm-hmm. We got all the like challenges of wanting to kind of fuck everyone sometimes. Mm-hmm. That's hot. You know, like we're like big naked chimpanzees. Yes. And we got to figure some Sexy, shit out. Sexy naked chimpanzees so sexy so sexy (laughs) and then we got to face all of our conditioned Mm -hmm. terror of intimacy all of our trauma so the universe isn't necessarily optimizing for true love per Mm. se in Mm -hmm. relationship the universe is asking you to be in truth and to realize yourself as the truth of love that you are so when you find that person it's going to alchemize a process for you to find the power to be in your truth it's going to alchemize a process for you to realize that you are love itself right Mm -hmm. your process of devotion, your process of truth, and both of you, your process of love, Mm -hmm. your process of truth, like it activates this deep journey of Mm -hmm. self-realization. The same way you can look at the universe and say, the universe doesn't want us all to just be like billionaires with like every dream and wish fulfilled. The universe is a wish fulfilling universe on some levels, but it wants to teach us. It wants us to be Mm. our truth more Mm. than anything else. Mm. And so why would true love be any different? Yeah. Why would true love be the only thing in the universe that isn't alchemizing you towards your highest truth? And when you alchemize towards your highest truth, just like in spirituality, right? You do an ayahuasca ceremony, you do a meditation retreat, you work with any spiritual teacher who's worth their salt, they're going to take you to a death portal of yourself, Mm -hmm. right? And you're going to stare through it and you're going to say, I don't know who I'm going to be on the Mm -hmm. other side, but I'm going to have the courage to jump. Yeah. As a couple, I think you walk yourself up to that death portal and you say, okay, I have to risk this relationship and I'm at a high stakes table. I'm risking something that I care about so much and I have to have the courage to be in my truth, my kind truth, my compassionate truth, my self-responsible for the impact truth and how I communicate it and how I share it with my partner. But my truth and my heart become more important than trying to shape this to be what I think I want. The universe wants us to be courageous warriors of the heart, and that's what true love will ask you to be. Mm -hmm. And the only way to really step into that is to be willing to risk it all Mm -hmm. in service of your truth, not just to risk it all because like I don't care, but truly to become ourselves. And so that's to me what makes your relationship so Mm -hmm. devotional is that at some point you switch from optimizing for forever. You switch from optimizing for, I just want to be with you at all costs, even if I'm not getting fulfilled, even if I'm stuck in my trauma pattern, into 
being in my radical truth and in my devotional heart yeah. is more important to me than this relationship lasting forever. Mm -hmm. But through that alchemy, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the thing about a death portal, you never know, yeah. right? You could, yes. could be that the truth is to break up, could be that the truth is that you stay together. That devotion that you woke up into, into yourselves and your heart and in your truth mm -hmm. became the devotion that you share together. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I would say like we were always in that conversation. Where yeah, we're like you know, from I, the beginning. I, from the beginning, I was like, if there's another person, yeah, that you feel this with or, yeah. and more, yeah. I want that for you. Yeah. yeah. So the, that freedom from both our ends was really built in, and and what's so beautiful now that yes, to everything that you're saying, is I think that when or feel that when you you get to this place now that we're embodying, it's the that extra aliveness that's always available. Yeah. And now the, the relationship feels like this is this is the home base. Yeah. Right. And to explore the extra aliveness feels so good now and so fun because we get to come back to the home base and talk about it and be like, yeah. oh my God, blah, blah, blah. you know, like, I'm so I have a crush on this and so and so and we had this thing, you know. And then now we're like in on it together, like we've traversed through enough of stormy waters and crazy contractions, expansions to to know that that's what the universe wants. Yeah. No matter what, yeah. you're going to have contraction, you're going to have expansion, it's just intricately linked. And and not to make up any stories around it. And and then, and again, who knows what the universe has in store. However, it really feels so good to yeah. be in a place now with enough life experience to know that we got this. Yeah. You know, and we, we have the tools now and the practices yes. that are built in so that when the aliveness comes in its various forms, we know how to alchemize it. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and make and make more like joy and love and connection yeah. and alchemy with it. So it's in service to us, service to our community, service to the world. Everybody benefits from it. Yeah. And I think also the awareness is like this is something that we both really embody in our in our separate lives and together is like I'm always gonna want more. He's always, we, we as human beings are always going to want more to everything you just so beautifully articulated. It's like, we are here to continuously evolve. And when we get into partnership, there's this desire to like make it so safe that it's immobile, mm. right? Is which I believe is what kills it and mm. which creates the cheating and all these other things versus going in on this fluid, constantly evolving morphic field of expansion. Mm. And when both partners are like, you know, you know, we say it all the time. It's like, we're walking hand in hand into the fire together. And it's, that's what keeps it interesting. Mm -hmm. And so it's not only do we have this aliveness, you know, around us, but the aliveness is built into our relationship because we're programmed. We've programmed ourselves into continuously saying the hard thing, continuously talking about the thing you don't want to and like growing constantly. And, and it's no longer scary because we've been doing it so long. It's exciting. Doesn't mean it's not hard. Each time we go through something, it leads to deeper connection, deeper intimacy, deeper passion. And so again, like any other pattern that we start to see, now we're just seeing patterns that serve us versus mm -hmm. enslave us. Mm -hmm. And to everyone, you have the ability to do that. It's not like we are special, we're not. We've just used our mind to serve us versus enslave us. We all have patterns, we're all working them. Mm -hmm why don't we try using a pattern that feels good versus feels disempowering? Mm. And uh, I would say too, one of the biggest things that we've learned is that thing of, you know, there's such a thing as expanding too fast. Yes. Right? So it's like when you expand, uh, it, you don't want to contract necessarily back to where you expanded from, but learn to rest in that new place, mm. right? Get comfortable with it. Like give yourself some time. Yeah. And Be then patient. when you feel good there, like expand again and learn to rest, you know, if we expand too fast, we're not prepared for it. So mm -hmm. it's like allowing it to be gradual so mm -hmm. you don't rush things. Cause I've certainly, and thank you, my love, so much. She's the one that's been more the breaks in the past, not anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, but I'm so grateful for it because she intuitively knew that we weren't ready for yeah. the expansiveness and the experience and the aliveness that I was desiring. Mm -hmm. It would have totally fucked everything up. Mm -hmm. And now that we are in this place, I'm like, I'm just gonna take my feet off the pedals. And she's like, gas 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 and i'm like are you sure it's just like yeah 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 yeah. i'm like okay let me put on the seat belt. Yeah. <laughs> but so it's beautiful how the tables have turned yes right mm -hmm. who's now in the driver's seat of mm -hmm. more aliveness sexually sensually mm -hmm. you know and me being like cool yeah. all right i trust you yeah. i trust us 
And I trust that we're in a place where we can get playful yeah. at a Layla Martin party, you know, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> I've heard you have parties. I, we, we want to be invited, uh, you know, and so, and so it's, it's really, really, um, exciting to, to witness the, the, the new iteration of us and where it's leading us. It's a completely new, like I, to what you expressed in the beginning, which I think is the most important aspect of this, which is create your own blueprint. Mm -hmm. Like I believe that's the time that we're actually in, mm -hmm. which is the death portal because it is the darkness. It is the void. It is something that has never been created or experienced or felt by you before. Get, let that be exciting because this, the way that our dynamic is, is not traditional in your like old societal traditional manner it is totally different and it and it's so thriving and so beautiful and so amazing and that's for all of us for men women whoever whatever you are and identify as is take yourself out of your own box yeah. and decide what feels good to you and it's dependent on who you are in that dynamic with mm -hmm. give yourself the freedom to explore that's the i think the scariest thing but you know can we traverse that you know put use our tools because yeah. we have so many of them and have the willingness to create what we want to experience. All right, let's talk about sex. <laughs> so let's start first. I want to talk both about how to have the most amazing sex. Mm -hmm. I also love Johan, something that you embody is kind of unabashed. Maybe we might call it alpha, but I think that can sometimes have like shaming connotations, even yeah. though we all know what it means. But let's say like warrior, mm -hmm. like, a, like mm. a strength and power yeah. um, and ownership of your sexuality that's really incredible. So I'd like to know more about that and some of your guidance for men around sexuality. Mm. Um, but first... There's this interesting thing that you said about, you know, having sexual challenges at some point in your mm -hmm. relationship, which is so important to hear. Yes. Because massive. You're both gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And you know, you were even younger then. Mm -hmm. And like that still happens, you know, because mm -hmm. so many people are like, oh, it's just me. And yet, literally, I don't think there's a long-term relationship where mm. people don't encounter sexual struggles. Yeah. Yes. I also think that we don't factor in enough how when you meet someone who is a deep, true mirror for you, who is opening your heart, that this can disrupt your everyday sexual operations. Yeah. And that we have this very culturally ingrained belief that like my person, I will have the best sex with like right off the bat, mm -hmm. but actually your person who like, can you know is maybe calling you to open your heart when your whole nervous system has been designed to like great sex is like if she lets me be here and here mm -hmm. right and now all of a sudden this one's like opening my heart mm -hmm. did you experience some of that of the like oh this isn't my normal sexual operating system and how did that impact you yeah it was very scary i definitely felt that and i didn't know if you were able to to meet in that way in mm -hmm. the beginning and we weren't for many years, actually. We, like Rachel said, we've always had good sex. And even when the infidelities happened, I actually enjoyed sex with Rachel more than the other people, mm -hmm. you know, which was a, a beautiful sign of like, again, I was uh, uh, really not appreciating all the things that were right, because yeah. we tend to focus on what's wrong mm -hmm. instead of seeing what's right. Mm -hmm. And actually, for me, it was a, this, a solo mushroom journey that I did to get clarity. And the mushrooms were like, yo look at all the things that are right and i literally cried like a little boy for for three hours and uh, and and i got to really remember all the things that were right however you know just yesterday we had mm -hmm. a conversation and and again our sex life is amazing and we we love each other and we have amazing sex we had a conversation that was very triggering for us around yeah. rachel desiring more like long sort of a leading uh, sensual makeup so her she's more in in the sensual energetic energetic yeah. realm and i'm more in the shapeshifter kinky you know let's fuck realm right mm -hmm. and and then we in the past we both didn't know how to meet meet or get ignited once we were ignited it's wonderful but how can we ignite each other mm -hmm. so we wouldn't sometimes have sex for longer periods of time because neither of us was like oh i'm turned on mm -hmm. and so we we're waiting for the other to you know to turn me on mm -hmm. or you know you turn me on type of a thing and yesterday we were just in this conversation of how can we meet in a new way mm -hmm. in our relationship in our sexuality where we're adding in those elements uh, of, of what you desire and what I desire. How can we, again, step out of the box that we've been in yeah. and meet each other? And you went, it was, got very emotional, got very heated. It was, you know, I want more of this, I want more of that. And again, 
we infuse in that gratitude and that awareness this is happening for us and even though it got difficult and challenging we got to a new level of ooh, this is really exciting we yeah. get to now explore and be in discovery and even make an agreement like it doesn't it's not going to go perfect right away yeah it's not going to show up like this is how it, you know we get to like fuck up we get to make mistakes we get to yeah. laugh about it we get to be vulnerable we get to you know not get it right so to say and you know now we're really excited to go home because we didn't have sex yesterday now that we've had the medicine here, to, <laughs> yeah. to go home and actually explore that yeah you know how can i meet her in a sensual way and she also had a story made up about something i don't know how graphic we want to get here as graphic as you want so one one of my favorite things uh, can I go there? Is that okay? Sure. Is is you know what turns me on the most is like Rachel bent over you know her ass cheeks like up in the air, me just going to town <laughs> on her <laughs> pussy and yeah. butt and all of that, right? And just going wild. And and she thought that part was like me skipping to because I want to like kind of skipping the kissing. Yeah. And skipping the sensual sort of thing and, and just doing that because I don't want to do the other thing. Um, and I was like, no, 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 this is the part that I'm like so excited. That gets me ready for the kissing and the other parts. That's like what turns me on and gets me going. And I can stay there and do that forever. And she was like, really? And I was like, yes. And and so there was, again, these stories that we yes. as couples even, you know, we know each other so well, yeah. so expressed, tend to have and run and we don't touch upon until we do. Yeah which again felt like a death process, very challenging. And now we're so excited to go home and have sex and explore this mm -hmm. new way of connecting. Um, and I, I kind of went on a rant. I don't know where it started. It must be your, your, your medicine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as long as it ended up with a graphic visual yeah. of Rachel getting pounded to her delight, I yeah. think everyone's happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, so so this question I have about the beginning because I, I find this to be very common actually about true love couples. Yeah. Um. And so so give me your truth around this, but it's like, as a man, you're like wired to have sex in a way that feels comfortable to you that yes. activates a certain primal gratification. When you meet a woman where you're like, holy shit, right? This is something so much bigger and deeper. Mm -hmm. It can interfere with that very known operating system. Yes. 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 What did that feel like as a man? Disempowering. Yeah. Um, and this is actually, I'm so grateful you brought this up. This is part of the conversation yesterday. And for me, as you know, as you said, alpha male, like I'm very comfortable in, in sex and sexual situations as long as I'm in charge, mm -hmm. right? And in, in that moment, it can feel like, oh shit, I don't know what I'm doing. Guess what happens to a dick, mm -hmm. right? It goes away. Mm -hmm. And unless maybe, you know, some men it doesn't. For me, like, unless I feel like I'm driving mm -hmm. and I feel that I'm sort of in, you know, in the driver's seat here and and it doesn't feel safe or mm -hmm. it doesn't feel igniting because then I'm, I feel like, oh, the like, story are, you, is, yeah. are you driving this now? Mm -hmm. Am I more in the driver's seat? Mm -hmm. And so it's very uncomfortable territory for me still to be in that place. And so my quest for myself is how can I, again, alchemize the knowledge that was just shared? Mm -hmm. And how can I still drive this and be in the driver's seat, stay in my alpha, right? Stay mm -hmm. in my turn on. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ravish you. I'm going to take you. And my, again, my desire is to give her as much pleasure as I can. That's mm -hmm. what turns me on, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and so how can I alchemize what I just learned and still drive this, mm -hmm. right? If I don't, if I'm not driving, I kind of like don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. All right. And so something that I love is that you articulated, we always had good sex, but later in our relationship, we now have amazing sex, mm -hmm. right? That's not a story that often gets told yes. for couples in long-term partnership. So what facilitated the transition between good, like we had good basic chemistry, we had good sex, right? You both actually used the word good. Yeah. And then you've now used the word amazing for what's happening now. Can you each give me like maybe top three things that took you from good to amazing? I, well, Definitely doing our erotic blueprints and finding out about our like erotic core values and what actually turns us on. That was a huge, through that was a portal because I think to what you just so beautifully expressed, you know, I think a lot of men have that program. Mm -hmm. And then as a byproduct, the partner or the woman, I should say in my account, like I felt, felt like my sexuality wasn't as important mm -hmm. or as valid mm -hmm. or as... Like it wasn't because it wasn't in his wheelhouse. It was like, 
less than. And mm. that was something that I think existed for us for a long time. Mm. So being able to bring that to the forefront and to see that my core erotic theme and values and, and blueprint is valuable and to find an avenue that can take us both to the place we want to go. Right. Was, so Rachel's talking about Jaya's uh, yes. erotic blueprints. So this is yeah. body of work created by Jaya, this amazing teacher. And you basically figure out what is your primary driver of being yes. turned on. And so people start to understand like, oh, I can be wired sexually where it's like, mm, how it looks like how fit like give it to me kinky right so things about like role play fantasy bdsm yeah um i can be wired centrally like yeah. i like a massage would just be like the best thing in the world to me i can be wired energetically which yeah. is like fuck me with your energy cock yo yes. and i can be all of them yeah. and sometimes when a sexual man, sometimes a kinky man, meets a central energetic woman yes. because our culture has prioritized sexual men's desires, fantasies, sexual yeah. expression, yeah. and to a certain degree kinky, but not always, um, it can override yes. a woman being like, like, can you meet me energetically? Yeah. Before you they, put anything inside of me, yeah, or even touch me, yeah. you know, and it's like what? And they think it's. I think it's like they. It's like it's not as sexy when when those people and we've now realized, and I think you and I know this. Like being fucked energetically is. S like, wow, it's so erotic and so kinky and so otherworldly, but there is that imbalance that's in society. And even further than Jaya, which is so amazing is, uh, you know, an erotic mind, which goes, I think that's what it stemmed from. And it goes even deeper into like our core erotic themes, which come from our childhood and explain and, and getting curious. So those three things, learning about that, getting curious and talking. Those three things were monumental and we still do them. And it's important, I think, for everyone who's listening, who's in relationship is like, this isn't a one-time thing. You're meant to continue to do this. We are 10 years in and we still do this. And it's not because our sex is bad. It's because we in inherently always want more. Mm -hmm. And instead of thinking that that means anything is wrong, thinking, thinking that it's because you have the strongest foundation to keep expanding. Mm -hmm. So two other things that took you, well, it sounds like continuing to grow and learn Yes, is number two. And then what's a third thing that took you from good to amazing in a long-term partnership? You want to say something? Uh, I, I would also say radical honesty. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, st staying curious and recognizing when you are just in a, 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 you because that's what our brain does. Like we mm. get into a pattern. This feels safe. Okay. You take your clothes off. Yeah. You make out for a little bit. You go down on each other. You have sex. You know. You take a shower. Whatever. You know. And you, if you do that, like every day for a year, you're like, oh fuck, we do the same exact thing in the same exact exact place. And because we're wired yeah. for novelty, yeah. we're then it's like, well, that's boring. You know, let me jerk off instead or masturbate instead or, or find it elsewhere instead. How can you continually keep it interesting? And it's by actually what we have found, having the hard conversations yes. is the aliveness that you're, that's the aliveness. <sighs> That's when you have the aliveness within you. Like again, there's a moment where you're like, I kind of don't like you right now. This is really uncomfortable. Like, are you and to the to the conversation we had last night, which was challenging. By the end of it, I was incredibly turned on, mm -hmm. and we've been in such an intimate, beautiful, even more connected space that we were already in. Mm -hmm. And I think that the other aspect is like make it a priority. I think I see this the most with couples is that there's this tendency to make their relationship and sex like last on the priority list. Mm -hmm. Like, well, my job comes first or this comes first. And it's Kids. like, I believe really truly with the depth of my being that everything stems from relationship, mm -hmm. especially when you have that level of partnership, when you folk, when that is good, everything else is good. And to like really reprogram like our clients over and over and over again. You want to make more money. You want to be more creative. You want to be better with your kids. Like have more sex, make that a priority, make each other and, and each other's pleasure your priority. And then there's, it's, you know, it's just fuel. It's energy that just overflows in your, in the entirety of the rest of your life. And I would say the, the one thing that I already mentioned earlier is we share a spiritual practice every single day. Yeah. And I, and again, I want to really honor you, uh, <laughs> Layla, because you've been such a teacher for us mm -hmm. in, in how to create ritual. Mm -hmm. You know, you are just a master of ceremonies. Yes. And I've learned so much from you and, and brought that into our own containers and practices and, and, you know, how I lead myself and others. And, and that is something that we do on the daily. Yes. Right? We, we practice every single day, even if it's short, mm. you know, and we have a lot of fun practices that we do. 
And I find that that's one thing that I really see or we see when we work with folks is like people don't do ritual together. Yeah. Mm. And if you don't do ritual together, you have all these like so much of happens here, but so much more happens here. Right. And unless you do a ritual where everything is expressed yeah. and the stuff that can't be expressed with words is expressed, you're going to grow apart. Yeah. And you're going to feel separate. Right. So it's so important to find a ritual that works for you and that you're committed to. Yeah. Because yeah. a ritual can look like giving space for conscious communication, yes. right? Deep sharing. A ritual can look like doing breath work together. Mm -hmm. A ritual could look like being in a heart meditation together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a ritual can look like having your morning practice of gratitude yes. or jumping in the ocean, whatever it mm -hmm. is, something like that. I would love to hear from you, Johan. Um, I actually asked this question of both of you, but Johan first. Um, what are three things that you think that men could adopt that would make them better lovers? Mm. One of the biggest things for me uh, that really radically changed my life was realizing that God is a woman, mm. right? That God is 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 not. Or also a woman, let's say, right? right? Rename God, GGD, God, Goddess Divine, or Goddess God Divine. And that alone, that understanding that you are dealing with, you know, a sacred being in front of you. Mm -hmm. And and that this, this relationship that you have uh, with uh, a person is sacred. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and again, I want to honor you because you do this so often, Layla. Yeah. You, you really infuse the sacredness into the sexuality, which makes it safe and profound and incredible. Mm -hmm. When we add that aspect in, that this is a sacred act, we're not just in our lizard, you know, being brain fucking procreating and Mother Nature's great at it. Like, we know how to do that, but how to rise above that. Mm -hmm. And another practice that's been so profound for me that I learned from one of my Tantra teachers, Alex Bartman, Alexa Bartman now, uh, is to not come. Mm -hmm. Take the orgasm out of the equation. Because again, men are driving towards a solution, right? We're solutionists. So it's like, how to how, make you come so I can come, right? So when you take the orgasm out of the equation, mm -hmm. so you as a man don't orgasm, that's what I mean. The woman can have as many as she wants and or you know who, whoever your partner is. You then realize that you've been driving towards a goal this whole time and that's what you've been focusing on but when you take that goal that orgasm goal out of the equation now the experience is the goal oh, yeah. and the experience the journey is the destination all of a sudden and that radically changes the way that you approach it mm. and i would say the third thing is is in really invite reflection mm. yeah. right from um from especially the feminine mm from your lover, from your sisters, your, your, your friends, you know, get curious mm -hmm. about, you know, the, your blind spots and what you don't know. And again, for the, for the masculine, it's very uncomfortable for us to be in the not knowing. Mm -hmm. We're so comfortable being in the knowing. Mm -hmm. And when we get to, instead of not knowing, it's like being discovery. Because mm -hmm. then you don't need to know. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be right. You don't need to have all the answers because you choose to be in discovery. Mm -hmm. And it's so freeing to show up like that. You know, I've heard so many stories from uh, friends of mine that are women that are like, this guy was like, you know, talked this big game and got to the bedroom and I was ready for the big game and he showed up with like zero game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's like a bad combo, <laughs> you know? So don't talk a big game because when you show up and if you don't, if you don't match your game, yeah. bro, you've already lost, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, how can we rather be in discovery, yeah. still be charming and funny and, you know, show up energetically, but be like, I don't know, but I'm willing to learn, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And that's the biggest thing, I think, where we really then get curious about all the modalities and tools and ways that we can explore. And that's when you get to be in your mastery of being in discovery and, and learn from the feminine, learn from the divine, make, make it sacred. Um, and it's forever interesting mm. yes <laughs> rachel what are three things that you feel the top three things that men can do to be better lovers mm. i think that to what johan expressed like taking the orgasm out of the equation but also for the women to take the orgasm out of the equation mm. so for both parties to be in pure discovery mm. and to not be goal oriented because mm. even if a man has taken his orgasm there's still a drive for the woman to come. And I think a, I hear this from so many women. It's like, we feel that pressure. Mm -hmm. None of us as human beings like pressure, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the erotic space, like it's not a 
a pressurized zone. We want um, friction and we want tension, but we don't want pressure. Mm. We want, you know, ebbs and flows and movement and mm. edging. And and when we don't feel like we're try- being forced to get somewhere, there's so much more to be discovered. And I, I think specifically for a, a woman's pleasure, like there's so much to be discovered in that realm and we need space. Mm. And the, the more space and like the excitement from the, from the man to have space and longevity and exploration is like, get ready for a wild animal. <laughs> um, yeah. It takes time for the wild animal to unlock. Absolutely. Yeah. And to, to, I think sp- another thing that's so, so important that Johan did such a beautiful job. I was like giving permission for the wildness. Mm. He was always from the very beginning, encouraging more like sounds, more, more of everything. Mm. It was always, he's always been, I want more, Mm. which is so freeing for, and, and, you know, healing for a woman because of, I think, especially in the early on our sexual experiences, we can have those moments that we carry around of like, where you made a sound or you squirted or whatever it is that traumatized you. And to have someone who's constantly giving you permission to be you know, completely unfiltered, unabashed, uncensored, um, and to feel safe in that is, is profoundly healing. And the other thing I think that Johan didn't mention is also ejaculation. Mm -hmm. You know, he's been practicing that since he was 20 years old. And so that goes directly in line with calling out the primal animal in Mm -hmm. us is like, Mm -hmm. Johan can last forever. Mm. And so, you know, that practice of fueling himself with that energy mm. keeps us also in a consistent sensual state, you know, it's like we can have sex every day because that energy is there, mm. right? And and then when we do, it doesn't last 4 minutes. It lasts 45 minutes and it's usually like, okay, I'm done now, mm. you know. Um and so there's there's spaciousness to really explore and I think that I for one as a woman desire more of that to mm. be available for men, more of that teaching to like, mm. because it's it's also the other, I'll say four, the other aspect of experiencing him and that state of pleasure mm. has also been mm. unbelievable, mm. you know, because it's like, again, it's just room to grow. It's exciting. There feels like the boundaries have expanded and the edges have expanded. And it's like this really sacred, holy, primal, animalistic space that we get to, experience together and it's endlessly in- interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And Johan, how did you master that, the non-ejaculation? So I read uh, The Multi-Orgasmic Man when I was 20, mm-hmm. Mantak Chia, and I started practicing, mm-hmm. you know, uh, on my own at first and then with partners. And then when I uh, learned, you know, through the experience that my orgasm is at least 10 times stronger when I ejaculate. I was mm. like, why would I ever ejaculate ever again? Like, this is crazy. What is ejaculation? Ejaculation is when you redirect the energy flow of your orgasm mm-hmm. into your body versus out. Mm-hmm. And I still do it manually. I know some men have mastered the, which means that I you know, put these three fingers between my balls and my anus. I press, I slow down my breath and my, I take my awareness down and I breathe this orgasmic energy up into my, my back, my belly, my chest. You know, I bring it all the way to my heart, to my brain, and I channel it into my partner. Mm. Um, or I can make other magic with it. And mm. it and it's the difference for me between ejaculation and ejaculation is mm. just crazy. Mm. Um, and uh, and so and when I don't, when I choose not to come mm. at all, you know, also breath and awareness. How can I embody this energy instead of just walking around super horny and like needing to jerk off or something? Right? How can I create with this energy? How mm. can I? use this energy to to make art to make love to you know do business to whatever mm. to heal my body uh to channel this energy as mm. a healing force and and it's really like learning these higher parts of ourselves that are available for mm. us that mm-hmm. we sadly in our culture in our western culture really haven't been taught mm-hmm. at all and and i'm so grateful that we live in an era where this technology is again available and it's not so shrouded in mysticism that, you know, men can now learn how to do this. Yeah. When I talked to guys of this, you know, it was just at a friend's party recently and they didn't know about it. And I was just like, yo, like, but they were all like, what? I was like, yeah. <laughs> and you can read this thing and da, 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 and so forth and so forth. And so there's interest. They're yeah. like, oh, I just want to come the old way. Again, if you do it the old way, there's nothing wrong with it necessarily, but you're in your lizard brain. Yeah. How can you 
be in your higher brain or higher higher frequency of your being so it can really become this divine experience that continues to expand and never gets boring mm. never gets mm. old mm. Mm-mm. and you are the creator and creators of the pyramid breath method and so i'm curious can you give our listeners like one way that they can use breath Mm. that helps them Mm -hmm. with that energy mastery during sex. Mm. So, for example, in in the Pyramid Breath Method, what we utilize a lot of Mula Bandha, like root energy. And Mm -hmm. and again, Mula Bandha has been described as a root lock, but really it's a root bridge. It's like... And by root, you mean the pelvic floor. Yeah, the pelvic floor. How to draw that energy, that how to... Take that contraction that we normally feel, how to expand it so it doesn't contract, but rather expands and how with your breath and awareness, Mm -hmm. you can move that energy then up the spine, into the heart, Mm -hmm. right? How can you take that turn on so your whole body, your whole being turns on? How can you add in the sound and undulation? How can you make yourself be in an orgasmic state Mm -hmm. without anybody else being involved? Mm -hmm. It's just you Mm -hmm. and I like to think the divine. Yeah. And you're making love to the moment, Mm -hmm. moment to moment to moment. And so it's so profound and powerful to master that, to learn that. So when you are making love, having sex, fucking, you, you, when your body wants to go to the biological modality of procreating, you know, making more of yourself, copies of yourself, you can actually sort of slow that program down and really like activate these other parts. Mm. And you're like, whoa, I am a divine being that's <laughs> chosen to come here to this human body, have this experience, whoa. <laughs> you know, and then there's another one here. I'm here. It's like, you know, it's multidimensionally orgasmic and blissful. And yeah. yeah. So just as a final, Rachel, for the men out there who are like, yeah, it's work. Like I, you know, that's the number one thing I hear from men. I don't want to learn how to become multi-orgasmic. I don't want to learn how to control my ejaculation because it's so much work. I like it just the way it is. If it's not broke, why why not fix it? You know what I mean? Um, And (laughs) I'm curious from you as a woman, what, what is so amazing about being made love to by a man who has mastered those things? I think that what we're all like seeking, especially in sexual space is this like, this like primal animalistic, like divine, holy, sacred aliveness. That's like wild and untethered and so alive that it's, it's like, it, it, shocks you in a way, like in a good way. And through these tools, you get to experience that and you get to experience that over and over again. And it only gets deeper. This is a a never ending portal that leads to more, only more. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I would be able to experience it without that time and space Mm -hmm. and without the safety that that brings. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that I I would say that there's no man who doesn't want that. They're like, I want, you know, oftentimes you're like, I want a woman who's like completely wild. That's how you get there. Yeah. You know, having so many orgasms. Yeah. 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 I mean, I like it's like, but I'm going to ejaculate after 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah. 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 It's like to get for a woman to be multi-orgasmic, which we all have the ability to, and I am, and I, and I wasn't before Johan, I had had, like an internal penetrative sexual orgasm twice mm. before Johan. And it was by chance. And it was like, oh my God, what happened? And with Johan, he, you know, it was, it was using for the men, it's using your consciousness, it's using your breath, it's using your body. And if you're feeling emasculated or disempowered, this is the greatest way to feel empowered yeah. and embodied and to feel in your alpha and in your energy and to give so much pleasure and to create an opportunity for multiple, multiple, multiple orgasms, yeah. which are only going to make you feel better about you and more connected to your partnership and who you are as a man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And so many men want freedom. So it's yeah. like, why in the world would you be tied to your ejaculatory reflex there's no freedom in that sexually. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's that's the one of the biggest misconceptions I think. And again, it's the fear of learning something new. Yes. And you know, you said you why fix it if it's not broken? It, if you're lasting three, four, five, ten minutes, it's broken. Mm. It really is broken. Uh, and you know, to to overcome that programming is so so important, yeah. so freeing, mm-hmm. so powerful, empowering. Mm. Yeah. You feel like a master of the your that sexual universe. You know that you can, you know, meet the moment, and 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 and, and it, it doesn't only apply to sex; it applies to everything in life. You learn how to use that energy mm-hmm. and that mindset 
across the board with everything that you do, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, so you're not just reacting uh, to the moment, you're, you're choosing to respond. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, please tell everyone where they can work with you and how they can stay connected to you. Mm. Uh, my website is the Pyramid Breath Method. No, no it's, it's pyramidbreathmethod.com. <laughs> it's actually pyramidbreath.com. Yeah, it's pyramidbreath. You're right. Uh, Pyram we, we, we want to. <laughs> yeah, okay. Pyramidbreath.com, yeah. people. Okay, okay. And <laughs> go. <laughs> so pyramidbreath.com. Uh, Rachel is, is I am Rachel Pringle. Dot com. com. And positive Pringle on Instagram and herb Johan on Instagram. Yeah. And yeah, we have lots of really delicious deep dives containers, a relationship mastery container coming up in October. And I have a woman's uh, erotic expansion, wild illumination retreat in June in Spain. And we're yeah, doing, we'll doing a, some festivals in Estonia and, and, and many a, other parts of Europe. And a men's container, mm -hmm. how to be a trustable, erotically expressed man that That's we're right. both going to be teaching. That's right. Woo! <laughs> Very excited. Great. Well, we'll include links to that in the show notes so people can easily find you. Thank you so much. What an incredible conversation. Uh, I love you so much. The you, best. Layla. Thank you so much for having us yeah. on. It's such an honor. Such, such a, a pleasure. Oh. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in to this Tantric Life. I hope that this conversation has inspired you into deeper devotion, deeper love, deeper truth, and a more powerful understanding of how we can all create sacred union in our own lives. It's my honor mm. and pleasure to be with you today. So after listening to Johan and Rachel, you're probably like, how do I have super hot sex like that? So my number one practice to unlock super hot sex is orgasmic breathing. Here's the thing about super hot sex. It's a practice. It's a commitment. It's a whole path and process to healing and integrating and hitting ecstatic states and overcoming thousands of years of oppression and sex negativity and reclaiming your full sovereign activated power through your nervous system. So this is just the first step. And yet it's a very powerful one. It can still unlock quite a lot for you. So just like breath work has been one of the most powerful things for people to be able to heal their immune systems and activate meditation and be able to take ice baths in powerful ways and just really come home to themselves. Breath work applied to sex is one of the most powerful tools as well. So when you use breath work during sex, you actually shift out of your nervous system from the part of your brain that controls and judges and thinks and calculates into the feeling part of you that experiences. And that's where the most lush, delicious, magical, primal, rich, and intimate sex happens. When we consciously shift out of our head and into our body, and it sounds so simple, and yet we're truly not doing it most of the time. So the simplest orgasmic technique that I can teach you is pussy or cock breathing. You can do this while you're self-pleasuring. In fact, I recommend that you try it while you're self-pleasuring first at least three times before you try it with a partner because it helps you get used to it without feeling maybe a little bit of shame or self-consciousness without having to deal with like, what if your partner loses their erection or she's not turned on by it or anything like that. And it helps you really normalize the experience inside of your body. So the next time you masturbate, I really invite you to set a timer for five minutes. And as you masturbate, you're going to inhale through your nose as though you could inhale into your pussy, cock, or intersex genitals. And as you do that, I invite you to just feel what you're feeling. And then you're going to exhale out of your mouth. And the more that you can do, it's called a connected breath where you don't have a pause between inhale and exhale or exhale or inhale. The better it's going to be, the more powerful. So the breath is like... right? So you're going to do that as you self-pleasure for five minutes. Now, here's one of the great secrets. Your body is going to want to start moving or you're going to want to start sounding in order to let the energy free flow through your body. The more that you breathe like this, the more you're going to actually invite your sexual energy to move up and in. You're going to invite your body to feel more, to get more liberated, to get more raw, primal, and sensitive just from these five minutes of breathing. It will retrain your body to feel sex more deeply rather than to think about it. 
You could do this with a partner as well, either before you have sex. So you can sit in front of each other, looking into each other's eyes and do the same thing. We're going to set a timer for five minutes, breathe in to your sexual center, and you can look into each other's eyes if you want. And this will activate your sexual energy. It'll activate your sensitivity. It'll activate your intimacy. And then the more advanced practice is as you're making love to start that deeper, fuller breathing together. Now, you might say, but I breathe naturally during sex anyways. Like eventually when sex gets really hot, I'm going to be, you know, inhaling and exhaling a lot like that. But the idea is that you actually do it when you're not so turned on, when you're not so supercharged. And what it will do, it will activate your energy, sensitivity, and intimacy early on. So you're going to have deeper, more potent sexual experiences that are super powerful. So enjoy this orgasmic breathing. It's been the source of so much pleasure and so much ecstasy for me. And it's really, really, really transformed how I understand the portal of sex, how hot it can be, how beautiful it can be, simply by using my breath to transition my nervous system from thinking, judging, and being goal-oriented into a rich world of feeling, which is available to all of us. And the fastest path to get there is by consciously breathing during sex. Thank you so much for being here, for listening to this tantric life. Thank you for making it to the end of a podcast. That is an accomplishment. And if you want to learn more, if you want practical tools and guidance in tantra and sacred sexuality, then head on over to laylamartin.com. Sign up with your email address. You're probably like, email, what is this, 1996? Let me tell you, my emails are special. They're also so not safe for work that we send them on Sundays because they are chock full of some of the most uh, licensed licentious education that you are ever going to find. So I share in-depth tantric trainings, practical tools that you can incorporate into your life every single day. I also talk about really embarrassing and shocking moments from my own life as I guinea pig this entire tradition for myself in my own life. And if you want to stay connected, that is the way to stay connected. We also have incredible resources there. So if you want to learn sex magic, breath work, uh, couple sex practices, tantric sexuality on the website, you can get those trainings for free. If you head over and check it out, laylamartin.com. Finally, go ahead and follow me on Instagram. Don't miss a single reel. That's at the Layla Martin. You can also follow me on YouTube to make sure you don't miss any of these podcasts. That is Layla Martin. And thank you once again, so much, so much, so much for being here. I can't wait to share more with you.